Hey, folks. Hey, hey. Happy Sunday. Thank you all for hanging with me tonight. Uh, yeah, we got a whole lot to cover. Can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure that my sound is good. Um, how's my sound? How's my sound? You know what? I'm reading these poll results, too. First of all, I have everything that I need over here, okay? I got my water and my tea. So to the 81% of you who said I was going to get up and have to run to grab something, whatever. I don't know. You might have to get up at some point later on. I don't know. Um, how's my sound? You can hear me perfect. All right. We're going to just jump right into it because I have a lot. Of, dang it. I do got to get up, but I'm not going to get up. I'll just sit still because like, y'all going to put me wrong. Dang it. Okay. Anyway. Um, crap. <laughs> Talked all the trash. I still got to get up, but I'm, I'm going to sit still. <laughs> all right. Um, let me see here. I just want to get this set up. Uh, sorry, I'm still kind of adjusted a little bit. All right, sorry, this just needs to be, yeah, bear with me. Okay, hopefully you guys, I'm not too far, you can still hear me good enough. All right, anyway, um, let's see, let me close out this poll. All right. Um, all right, let's see. Somebody said, however, it's been 26 years, 17 days since his last drop. Ain't that a, a live gen and It has been 26 years. 17 days, been the five days. Yeah, that was my song. Calvin single handedly carries uh, bread too because he takes, um, or because his takes are simply real in life. I appreciate that. What up, Annoyed Human? What up, Julian Steve? What up, Janet Bennett? What's up, United States America President 48? Said America is a mess place now and um, into the society. We are all stuck with Joe Biden and Donald J. Trump for the Oval Office. Yeah, it's going to be a wild November. Um, yeah, it's a lot going on here. What up, Tim? Uh, official, let's likely, what up? Poison Ivy, what up, what up, what up? What up, Tramel Dorsey? What up, Tyler Hackner? Um, Iron Will, what up, sir? Corey T. Sissy, what's up, what's up? Um, let's see. Bethany McGowan, Lexi192, what up, what up, what up? All right, I want to go ahead and kind of start just because I got a lot to cover. And God willing, we'll get through it all. If I didn't get to you, please forgive me. It's not on purpose. It's just that I love the love. I really do. Um, we just, y'all know these lives be like five days long. So I'm trying to keep it to a, a certain time frame where we're not just on here all night. But anyway, um, a few quick announcements. Book club, the next session is going to be April 22nd. That's on a Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern. We are still reading. The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride, and we will be covering chapters 12 through 18. It's open to anyone. Closer to that Monday, I'll actually post a new community note with the link for the Zoom um, as far as those who want to participate. It's open to anybody. All you got to do is click the Zoom link, and we're on there, right? Chopping it up, going over the book. Sometimes people just like to listen. Some people haven't read the book. They just want to be a part of the discussion. Everybody's welcome. It's all good energy. Peace and love, right? So that's what that is. Um, I appreciate the patience. Y'all know I've kind of been out of town for a little bit, so I hadn't really been home. And it's crazy because it's almost like all the wildest things take place when I'm not here. And this camera's a little too high. Let's bring that down. So, all right. It's like all the wildest things take place when I'm never home, right? There were so many things that happened. I'm like, dang it, right? I couldn't wait to get home, right? But I went to Dallas, had a really great time. Dallas, I will say, wonderful place to visit. Great food, had, a, had an amazing time, but y'all drive crazy. <laughs> like y'all do some driving in Dallas. I was like, Lord, I thought DC was something, but it was like every Uber I got into, I was in that back seat, like holding the door. And you know how, um, if somebody's driving wild or driving crazy, you kind of, as a passenger, you'll hit that emergent, or that invisible brake on the floor. You be stumping the floor. I was like bracing on the door. I'm holding on to it. Like what kind of, where we going? And mind you, the contrast between like a DC and Dallas First of all, D.C. is very dense, right? D.C. to me is not built very well for cars. Like, there's a lot of really narrow streets. Anybody that lives here, you know, street parking is a gamble in residential areas because all it takes is one person to zoom through and clip your mirror. But Dallas is spread out. Like, the freeways are wide, like, wide. And I'm like, what are we rushing for? All this space out here. And y'all still trying to kill somebody. Lord, man. And I will say Dallas isn't really the most walkable city. You really do need a car. So I was trying to save money because I kept Ubering and everything and everything is spread out. So I'm like, dang, all these Ubers are like $20 and $30. And so I said, well, I'm going to just, you know, I found this restaurant I like because they had this crawfish chowder that was hidden. I was like, I'm going to just walk to that. 
I thought I could walk to that thing. Why did the, my GPS have me almost walking on the side of the freeway? I'm like, where are the sidewalks around here? Let me go ahead and call it Uber because I'm not about to get hit by a U-Haul. Like, man. But um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. My only beef was when I was going there, I was on Southwest because, you know, I got, got found the cheapest ticket I could get. And it was one of them dang 737s. And they had me in the emergency exit row. I'm like, Lord, look, I didn't even want my knee touching the door while I was sleeping. Because I was like, it'd be just my luck. My knee will hit that door and something will unlatch and the whole door pops off and I get sucked out the plane. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but I had a really, um, <laughs> a really good time. So that was, that was really cool. Um, in music news. So it seems that everybody and their mom is on tour right now. Like everybody, like. I don't have enough to go to all these shows. I, I told y'all I'm trying to be more physically responsible with the finances just because there's been some really big projects I needed to finance. Amen to the fact that one of the big, big ones is finally wrapped and completed and paid off and I'll never have to look at it again for any kind of financial reasons. Amen to that. So that kind of opens up a window. But y'all know I'm a concert junkie. Like I'm trying to see everybody. And I was looking at all the tickets and the shows. The show I'm the most excited about right now, I'm really excited about the Missy Elliott show. I think it's dope. Missy Elliott... Busta Rhymes and Sierra. Busta been getting on my ner nerves a little bit over the last few years. Some of the stuff he says, I don't agree with. But as far as Missy, looks like that would be a really dope show. Sierra, I have, I've never seen Sierra live. I've seen Missy at Essence. I don't think I've seen Busta before. But I know that that will be an amazing show. It just, I don't know. That's a good mix uh, of entertainment, right? A good mix of visuals, musicality, creativity, innovation. It's going to be a great, great show. But it just kind of took me back. Like when I was thinking of like... um. Because I feel like their heyday is my teenage years, right? Uh, like even Sierra, like when Sierra came out, that was high school for me. And I just remember when she was doing that day, remember she do that Matrix, that Matrix she used to be doing? When I say every dance team back in the day had that somewhere in their routine, everybody was doing the Matrix, you know, even at the school dances. I'm like, everybody was getting down to these songs. When Miss, and then when they had Lose Control, <laughs> right? Man, that was, that song was gold for any choreographer. Like. I, what a time, you know, what a moment. Um, but it made me think, cause I was like, man, I remember the school dances used to be lit. This is when I still used to like perform and stuff. And I remember the coolest thing would be like, if we ever had a show or a performance, cause I was on a few dance teams, the dopest thing that could ever happen at the school dance is that they played the song that you just performed at some show. The way <laughs> we used to be so present, everybody, you know, make room, make room. We would be so serious in there having like full out routines, <laughs> like, but, you know, um, it's weird though, because I, I do teenagers dance anymore at the school dances? Because I feel like, you know, in this era of social media where and everybody's so pressed about what people think about them or everybody's so pressed about how they're going to look that I feel like people aren't having the same amounts of fun because they're too worried about being caught on camera or it's all about the aesthetic and how they look. I was like, is that still a thing? Because I said this before, but one of my favorite things to do if I go to a concert, I love to watch people who have no rhythm and who can't dance enjoy themselves. It's the best thing ever. Just because you get to see people just like let their guard down, be loose, be free, and just have a good time. It's my favorite thing to do with concerts is, is kind of enjoy the show, but kind of people watch and see what other people are doing. Because it's always interesting to see people who have like no sense of rhythm, anything, but they are just living their best life. It's always the best energy out there, right? It, it reminds me of my parents because as much as I love them, Neither of them ever could dance. They never had any rhythm, especially my mom. I love her, but I don't know. I don't know how I ended up being all talented and because my parents didn't have it. And it's funny if you've ever seen my mom dance. Like you don't know what you're watching, and and, and it confuses me because I'm like, this is a black woman from the south. How you don't got no rhythm, right? I mean, and then she would throw a clap in there. I'm like, what are you clapping? We not a church. All right, go get it in, mama. Get it in. And it's so funny because um she narrates how she dances, right? She, oh, I'm about to do. and then she'll say, she always says, drop it like it's hot, but she says it like she's like, drop it like it's hot. I'm like, drop it like it's hot. I'm like, mom, what the <laughs> it's so funny. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm like, do people dance anymore? I hope my mom's not watching this. She's gonna be so mad I'm cooking her right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's um, I don't know. I feel like the kids don't be dancing like that. I remember when I was still running the center, one time my teenagers had asked me to be a chaperone at like their school dance, but I turned it down. I was like, cause I didn't even want to see them in that light. Cause I, I can just imagine what happens at these dances. I was like, I don't want to see y'all that way. So no, but um, man. So yeah, there's the Missy Buster and Sierra show. I definitely have tickets to that one. I'm only, the only three I know I'm going to for sure is Missy Buster and Sierra. That show, 
I know I'm going to see Janet. It, I'll be talking all this trash, but every time she come, I still be there, right? Every time I'm always see Janet. Janet will be 155 in a wheelchair on oxygen with a pacemaker, and I'll still be front row paying top dollar. And then I got tickets for Usher in New York since DC sold out right away. Um, so I got Usher in, you know, I think he's doing like six or seven shows at Barclays, and I think I'm show number five. So Usher, you better be there. You don't want to set up and, and booked all these shows. I don't want to hear about no laryngitis or bronchitis or asthma, torn vocal cord. I don't want to hear none of that. My show better be as lit as show number one, right? Especially if I'm traveling for this show. Oh, uh, yeah, me and one of my good friends are going to that one. So Usher, I know that'd be a fun time. Um, I haven't bought tickets to this one yet. I don't know if I'm going, but I still want to go. The Escape and SWD show, and it also has 702 Total and Maya. What's jacked up, Maya won't be at the DC show, even though she's from the DMV, whatever. But um, I've seen SWV at Essence. I've seen Escape about three times. So I'm kind of like, since I've seen them all, it's not a, a top priority, but I, I'm sure it'd be a good show. I wish Escape could get it together and the four of them could work it out. But dang, they still got their drama. I don't know if they're ever getting back together. Um, Maxwell and Jasmine have a show, which I know is going to be so good. I think I want to go, but I don't need to spend any more money. I've seen Maxwell like three or four times. I've seen Jasmine ooh, probably like five times at this point, even though I missed her when she was here last time. I, I remember one time when Jasmine was on the reality show tour, me and one of my good friends had went, and there was an opening act who, they were cool, but, you know, we were like, yeah, let's, you know, let's get a drink so we can get on through this set. I don't know what was in that drink, but all I know is by the time we could remember where we were at, the show was over. I was like, wait, we missed the show? Like, we, I remember being at the show, but I don't remember the show. I just know we had a great time. And so it was... So crazy. We were like, let's just book tickets because she's coming back next week. So we just went back and did it again. But that time we were like, no drinks. Let's actually focus. And so, yeah, Jasmine was really, really good. Um, like I said, Janet and Nelly. I don't know why Nelly is on this tour. Nothing against Nelly, but uh, Nelly to me, Nelly is company Christmas party music. You know, he was a great time in middle school, but it's there's just certain songs and acts I don't care to see. You know, if I go to a party, there are certain songs I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear This Is How We Do It. Because I know, to me, again, company Christmas. Me, white folks love that. This is how we do it. They, they cut up, okay? That comes on right after Sweet Caroline. I don't want to hear it. So it's kind of like, uh, Nelly's cool. I, knowing me, since I just live right by the arena, knowing me, I'll just come late. Y'all let me know when Nelly's off the stage. I'll come for Janet. <laughs> but um, she should have just stuck with Ludacris. If, that, if, you know, this is just an extension of the tour she was already on, she should have either stuck with Ludacris or she could have brought TLC on. They did, like, the Japan shows. I'm like, that would have been pretty dope. But, um, yeah, who else? Um, And this is not a dig at Nelly. He's just not – I mean, I'm not going to lie. He got some fun songs, but I don't want to hear Hot in Here. You know, when I hear Hot in Here again, I think of Company Christmas Party. I think of, like – middle-aged white folks at the company Christmas party with the gelatin and they're having a good time and you, you're forced to go and you don't get along with half the co-workers anyway, but you got to be there to show face. And yeah, hot in here's a great time, but I don't want to hear it live. You know, I don't want to, uh, whatever. I'm not going to be a hater. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be a fun show. Cause I, even when Janet had Luda, I didn't know how Luda was going to be, but Luda actually was a really, really great time. Luda was, a, his set was dope. That was, he honestly could have done his own thing. It was a dope time. Who else? Um, one of my friends wants to see Meg Thee Stallion. I don't know her music like that, but I don't mind going if they pay for the tickets. I'm not paying, but um, I'm sure she will have a fun show. Nikki was just here last week. I didn't go, um, but from what I heard, it sounded like it was a good time for the people that went. It was Nikki and Monica. I've seen Monica like seven times at this point. So I'm trying to, there's some folks where it's like you see them so much, it's not even an event when they come to town, right? Um, Monica's one of my first concerts I've ever seen, and I've seen her so many times. I haven't seen her at Howard twice. I've seen her um, in concert. Every time I saw Escape, she was on the ticket with them. She, um, where else have I seen her? Essence. Um, everywhere. I would like for her to do a full solo tour. That would be dope. Um, who else? Oh, Tony Braxton. All right. Tony Braxton is such the entertainer, but that's in Vegas and I'm not traveling for anybody this year. Like, nah, I love Tony. Love me some Tony. Had a great time when I saw her in 2014. I like Tony's shows because she's very interactive, right? She's going to sit on the piano and play. She's going to have a portion where she brings people on the stage to come and dance. She's going to pass you the mic to let you sing a piece of another sad love song. She's going to come in the audience and she's going to sit on all the guys' laps and then shakes the wife's hand. Like, Tony is a great show. Cedric the Entertainer, he's cool, but for me, he reminds me of kind of like when your mom has company and they put something on that they need to laugh at. 
you know, they're going to put him on or, you know, they put on one of the Tyler Perry plays or something. But Cedric has never really made me laugh. Right. The, the one Cedric joke that really had me cracking up one time was when he was talking about Mary J. Blige, when he was talking about, you know, sometimes she'd be singing stuff, but she don't be saying all the words right. And he was talking about not going to cry. And he was like, you know, was your lover and your secretary? Like that one joke had me dying. But other than that, I can't think of nothing else he's done where I was like hysterical. So that ain't enough for me to get on a plane and fly to Vegas and book a hotel for it. But Tony, if you decide to come back to the DMV, I'll be there. Um, Fantasia is here. I don't think she's on tour, but she's doing spot dates. That'd be a great show. I've seen Fantasia once and I, I wish her set was a bit longer. I saw her at Essence as well, but they only gave her like 40 minutes, but that'd be a dope show. Um, so I kind of want to see that one. And then Mariah Carey's in Vegas. I'm like, why are all y'all on tour? Like, we're, we don't have any money. <laughs> like, Lord, all y'all on tour at the same time. Y'all need to spread this out. Y'all need to go in shifts. Um, Mariah's in Vegas. I've never seen a full Mariah concert. I've seen a Mariah performance. Like, I was at BET Honors, and that's when she performed um, Eternal, Your Mind. But I like Mariah, but I'm also not flying to Vegas. for. I'm just not flying for nobody. You know, I can, I can, you know, I can hop on a train for two or three hours to see Usher for, you know, 50 bucks. But uh, a few hundred dollars to fly to Vegas in a hotel, I'm just not there. You know, I do like Mariah, though. Um, Babyface is also in Vegas. I just saw him with Anita Baker, so I'm good on that one. Um, but he, he is a fun show. There's Tank and Carl Thomas and Carrie Hilson. That might be the first show I don't really have a, a huge interest in. I think they're all talented, but I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm good. Great vocalist, great talent, great music, but it's I'm not that pressed. Janae Eichel's on tour. Same thing. Nice music. Not really for me to sit through live, but, you know, some cool songs. I did like Eternal Sunshine. You know, that was a nice one. Um, then you still got Lovers and Friends. Like, that's the, the big show with, half, with everybody, but... Um, I don't like super, super huge crowds, not in this current climate we live in, because every time there's always some lunatic that want to shoot up everything, right? Especially the mass shooters. So that stuff like that makes me nervous. And then it's outside on that tarmac with just the sun beaming. And I don't know if y'all been to Vegas around that time, but it's scorching outside. So I'm good on that. But I feel like if you're trying to save some money and see everybody, just go to Lovers and Friends, because half the people I just mentioned are on there. The ushers at that. Sierra's there. Janet is there. I think Missy's there. You know, just go to that show. Um, Essence has not announced who their lineup is. And I feel like it's because they're probably in competition with lovers and friends. So it will be interesting to see who they have on their lineup, but it's just all these folks on tour. I said, well, who's going to tour next year? Cause it's like, everybody's out. It's like, man, I feel like Angela Bassett and, um, waiting to excel. Like I've been to the bank. I've been to the bank. Thank you. Thank you for thinking of your children. Like, God, like we, we don't have it, man. And then all these shows be expensive. Lord, my God. Their children are not for sale. All right. Let me read some comments real quick, and then we're going to get to OJ real quick. All right. But that Missy show, that's going to be a fun one. If I was like eight, nine years younger, I would have definitely tried to audition to be one of Missy's dancers for this tour. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. Um... Teddy A said, yeah, Google Maps sent me down walking in the highway. I was like, the devil's a liar. Yeah, because when I was trying to get to whatever place, it's some restaurant I was trying to get to, and I'm walking, they're like, you know, turn left here. I'm like, left onto what? That's a ramp to the freeway. <laughs> like, and mind you, I had it set for walking. I was like, nah, I'm going to just, let me get an Uber. Let me walk on back. I'd already walked 15 miles. Well, I ain't walked 15 miles, but it felt like I was walking forever. But, man, yeah, they weren't playing. Mm hmm Pisces and Beauty said, remember when we all used to want the emergency exit row? Yeah, I, I used to like that row because I, I got long legs and long feet. I'm a size 12 shoe. Been that since I was 13 and a half. So like those planes, I can sometimes I can't if I have like if I've got on like some big shoes, like some like boots or something, I can some my foot sometimes can't, can't even get under the seat. So that's why I always like the emergency exit row because you got all that leg room. Right. Um, But now that all these planes is falling apart and they didn't have did stuff. It's like, all right, I don't want to be by the suction area of the plane when you get sucked out the plane. <laughs> like, man. Um, Let's see. Look, all y'all are going to see these people. All y'all are going on these tours, huh? Somebody said everybody wants to charge 300 for tickets. Yeah, like, if all y'all are going to go on tour, I need everybody to mark down. Like, I feel like a fair price for concert seating at an arena at this point. Because right now, a lot of these folks got seven and $800 tickets. I'm like, y'all need to be for real, right? I feel like for the 400 section, that, that's the very top. When you bump your head on the roof, 
those tickets should only be between about $50 and $70. And then if they got a 300 section, you know, that's the next section down. It's usually really, really small. You know, that section may be $75 to $90, right? Then that 200 section, that's kind of like the, the first big upper or the second big upper section. That should never be more than like, I don't know, 150. Then you get to the 100 section. Okay, that range there, that could be about one. 100 to 250 ish. That's already kind of high, but I'm, I'm trying to be reasonable here. I'm thinking of production value, right? And then the floor, I feel like back of the floor, and when I say back of the floor, I mean the very back, because if you're in the back of the floor, the seats really aren't that good. You can't see anything. That should be more than like 150. The middle of the back of the floor should be about 175. The middle of the floor should be 200. And then the front middle should should be more than 300. And then you can charge 500 for the very front half. You know, this is going to be people that pay. But when these folks are charging like $900 and $1,100, and then and that's not even resale, I said, y'all need to be for real, taking everybody money. And then all y'all want to tour at the same time. Like, man, my God, right? Let's see. Corey T said, yo, in middle school, I used to give this girl my lunch money just to have her do that dance on request. Oh, that, that's that Sierra Matrix. I wish I could find some of them old videos. I could do that crap. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna do it tonight. I'd be like busting my head on the back of that table over there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I used to be ready. <laughs> I used to be ready. Um, let's see. Somebody said Buster canceled his tour because of low ticket sales. I mean, that's a smart idea to hop on the Missy tour then. Um, let's see. Lyric Brothers said school dances used to be lit. They really were, like, especially where I grew up, because, again, I was from a small town, um, and my parents were pretty strict, so I couldn't always just go out. Like, there was no such thing as, like, I lived 40, about 40 miles from Seattle. There was no such thing as, my, hey, mom, we're all going to Seattle tonight. She's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you staying right here in this little town of Spanaway. So the school dance for me was the club, right? So that was an event. Like, man, and them little two hours from seven to nine uh, at, at the middle school, and then when I got to high school, I think the dances were from eight to 11. Man, that was my time to show out and have a great time. That was the club for me, right? Come home, like, soaked. Like, you could wring out my shirt. I was in there dancing so hard. But, um, man, Omega said, can Marcus dance? Marcus is my younger brother. Uh, maybe they pass it to their sons. Marcus, yeah, Marcus got rhythm. Marcus can do everything I can do, right? He and I, we're, we're polar opposites, but we have very similar, like, talents. And, yes, we can kind of do much of the same thing. I think he's a better singer than I am. I'm a better dancer than he is. But he can do everything. And then he can play drums. I play keyboards. And then we're both trying guitar, right? I want to learn how to play bass because I feel like that's the dopest instrument you can play. I just, every time I put on Michael Jackson's Get On The Floor or the Brothers Johnson Stump and they get to those bass riffs, I'm like, dang, if I could, oh, I wish I could play the bass. So, um, yeah, man. Teddy A said, I'm black and a child of West African immigrants from the South and have no rhythm. Now you can't be coming from the motherland with no rhythm now. I ain't gonna judge, but that's okay. Um. Let me see. Um, Jalil said, well, I'm about to meet Janet. See, y'all go ahead. I love Janet, but I'm not paying to meet nobody. And I saw the meet and greet prices. I ain't, I love my favorite entertainers, but I, I'm not paying for meet and greet because most meet and greets are, they rush you in there with 30 other people. You stay next to the person. You don't get a chance to talk. They say, smile for the picture. And then next. That's just going to piss me off because I'm if I'm paying a whole segment of rent to meet somebody, I, you better give me about five, six, seven minutes, right? Can't do it. If I meet Janet, I'll meet her in some other capacity. Um, let's see. Calvin, would I would you go to a pretty Ricky, Ricky concert? Um, if they're a part of a, a larger lineup with a bunch of other folks, you know, sure for the nostalgia, but they weren't really my group to begin with. So yeah, them by themselves, I have no interest in seeing, right? <laughs> you know, like when they, when remember when I used to have the Scream tour? Well, that was more so for the girls though, but like the Scream tour would be like Bow Wow, Marion, Pretty Ricky, and some of the other folks. Like I never had an interest in going to none of those. So when I think of them, I think of that. Let's see. Somebody said, what about J-Lo's concert? Um, not really. I mean, I, like I said, I live by the arena. If I happen to be walking past and they had some tickets on sale for 50 bucks, sure, I have a great time. Um, but uh, no, I'm not paying like no $200 to see J-Lo. She's, 
I will say, because I feel like it's interesting. We're in this weird era now. J-Lo has been getting whacked all month. I don't know what she did to who, but all of these publications and blogs and YouTube, everybody's cooking this lady. I'm like, what did she, did she kill somebody? Because damn. Um, yeah, like I said on the last live, she's not really, I, I feel like the challenge I've always had with her, her is she has no real musical identity. I think she's an interesting performer, oddly enough. I think she understands showmanship. Vocally, she's not really anything to get excited over, but I think if you're into like nostalgia and you know that you're gonna get this visual show, she probably will have a really cool show. Um, I'm she wouldn't be of all the people that I just named, she wouldn't be one of the first ones I'm running to. But hey, if they got a really good mark off deal for like 50 bucks, I might think about it, right? Um, because like I said, she got a few songs I did like. Um, but yeah, they they've been whacking that lady. And it's weird because I'm like, all of this stuff we've already known, like, especially on this channel, we've been talked about her kind of using other vocalists reference vocals on the songs and then her just kind of lipping them. That's been a thing we've been talking about for years. Remember that time I talked about when she was on, I think, Letterman and she was doing If You Had My Love. And this is when they were putting this is when they first were starting to put Pro Tools in people's microphones. Right. And um, for some reason, it, it was still off key because the thing about Pro Tools in a microphone, this phone keeps vibrating. Leave me alone. Let me, put, let me put it on something soft so I don't got to hear it. Um, the thing about Pro Tools, and this is the same for if you're recording in the studio, uh, not Pro Tools, I'm sorry, Auto-Tune. The thing about Auto-Tune is if you're singing into a mic that's already fit with Auto-Tune, Auto-Tune is trying to correct your pitch in real time. But the problem is if you can't really hear yourself or if you're not a very confident singer, that pitch correction will throw you off and you'll be even more off key trying to sing like through that. And so there's this interesting performance on YouTube where she's at Letterman. She's doing If You Have My Love. And this lady is fighting for her life on this song. I said, Jayla, what, what's going on here? But yeah, um, yeah, they are whacking that lady. Lord, my God, I could see if it was like, I could see if she had like the best selling album out right now and she was everywhere and people were sick of her. But I'm like, she's not even really having a super great run right now so what is the point of dragging the lady so much like man i feel like there's other people who deserve a, a, a greater lashing than j-lo i think we've always kind of just put j-lo in that box of she's entertaining but she's not like the standard of music and accolades and acclaim but you know i'm sure she'll have a good show um let me see Jarrell said, I really want to see Tweet and Tamia. Tweet has an excellent show. I've seen her like three times. She always gives a really great show. She's always in good voice. Very underrated. When you guys get a chance, definitely check out um, the We Sound Crazy podcast. They just had an episode with Tweet. It's really, really good. Um, it, side note, it's kind of cool how you kind of know a lot of these people that are on some of these platforms. Like I said, a lot of the people in this YouTube world or in this podcasting world, a lot of us all used to post on the same music forums when we were teenagers. So to kind of see some of these folks get these larger platforms over time. It's like really cool. It's like, oh, I remember them. Like, um, I know this person. Yeah, he and I used to post on this one. So that's pretty cool. All right, we got to keep moving. I ain't even got the OJ yet. Um, that's why I normally put music at the end of these lives because I'll get in my music soapbox and not shut up. Um, somebody said, I like the Cedric skit where he brought on all his TV wives. Oh, I will say the other Cedric thing I did like, um, when he, remember he had the variety show for like four episodes? But when they had that skit with the take your uh, kid to work day, that was hilarious. Where it was that the black news anchor and the kids wouldn't sit down while she was trying to <laughs> report the news. That was funny. I'll give him that. Um, man, let's see. I didn't go to the Drake show. Um, rappers are boring to me. There's not too many rappers I'll sit through unless, like, if there's a rapper that goes, I'll see Kendrick because I know Kendrick is going to give a full show, right? Kendrick is going to have some energy and bands and all kind of stuff. I'll see Kendrick. I'll see Jay-Z. Nas is my favorite rapper, but Nas be kind of boring, to be honest. But I'll still see Nas. Um, Little Brother doesn't really tour like that anymore, but I'll always see them when they come to town. Um, Common is so irritating as a person now, but he gives a great show. His shows have always been really lit when I saw them, seen them. Um... That's really it for rappers. I, I feel like, now I will say, I think the women rappers kind of do a bit more. I think like you, you throw in the Nickies and everybody else, they kind of put more emphasis on the showmanship of what's happening. Um, so I think the women right now, as far as rap and what they're doing on stage are more entertaining than the men, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, a lot of rappers are boring on stage. Like I'm not paying all that money to just, you'd be mumbling, ain't no band. You just got a DJ. Boring. All right. Anyway. Um, okay, I gotta move on, y'all. <laughs> Let's see. Raywin said, did you ever see Madonna? Can I tell y'all a quick story? So, 
it's so interesting because I've seen I've seen him in the media too. So not him, Madonna, but this is shifting to what's his name, Gerard Carmichael. Madonna was here for like three nights, and I was debating if I was gonna go because y'all know my relationship with Madonna. You know, I respect the the history, but she's never really been a favorite of mine. She got some songs or two I like. Um, but she was here. The, the challenge of living by the arena is every time somebody comes, you be wanting to go. Like um, Bad Bunny was just here last week. I I can't name a single Bad Bunny song, but just from everybody being outside in the line, and I mean, they had grills outside and making street corn and stuff. I was like, okay, it was interesting watching the demographics of the city change by the arena. But I was like, should I be going to this show? Because it seemed like everybody going. But yeah, so it was the same thing with Madonna. And they had like a whole bunch of tickets that were marked down. Because you know, like, when it's close to the concert, if there's seats that haven't been sold, they start marking stuff way, way down just to get butts in the seats. And so I was almost about to purchase. And then one of my friends was like, hey, I got tickets to see um, Gerard Carmichael. He's at DC Improv. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll go to that because they already got tickets I ain't got to pay. Tell me why. The um, show I went to is the show that's featured in that documentary he has on HBO Max. I haven't seen the, the show yet, but I saw the trailer. I was like, wait, I was there that night. And it's interesting. I'm not going to say what I think about the the, the um, show that I set through because what actually I'll say this my channel. I'll do what I want. I didn't care for the show because I didn't realize it wasn't like a full out comedy show. It was him kind of setting up for the reality show he was doing. And so when we went, um, you know, he's sitting there on the floor. He has all the jokes written down like on the floor and stuff. And then his energy was just real. He was on like a two. I was like, is this what he normally does? Because I don't. I knew of him because of the the sitcom that was the Carmichael show that was on for like a few seasons with um, Loretta Devine and, and David Allen Greer. I remember that, but um, I had never really sat through any of his comedy shows. So I didn't know what his comedy was going to be like. So I was like, okay, you know, I live a little. Plus my friend always gets like good tickets to everything. So anytime they invite me, I'm going. And so she and I went and then it was like, you know, he's telling the jokes. And again, he's like at a two. I was like, Okay, and then he'd be telling a joke, and he'd forget it midway through, and then stop, and then look at the floor, and then remember the rest of the joke. And I, to be fair, comedians also like to test out a lot of their material at like local spots before they go on tour or before they do a special. So that happens sometimes. But it was kind of like, I'm glad I ain't paid for this one. And then a lot of his jokes were questionable. He had one part in there because um, he was talking about, you know, he's he, I think at the time his partner was like this white man, and he was talking about how like the the partner was like this super over the top white liberal. And then at this point, Gerard was kind of questioning whether or not he was a Republican because he was like, I'm rich at this point. I might as well be. I was like, okay. All right. It was just a very interesting show. So I ended up missing Madonna to go to that. I should have just went to the Madonna show. <laughs> like, man, because at least she, she could have at least, because the Madonna song I like is the Don't Tell Me. Like the, the, when she got the cowboy hat, the dun, 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 dun. that was my song in like middle school. I used to like that. So I was like, okay. But um, man, and like Human Nature was a good one. That was a Human Nature. Secret, take a bow. What else did she got? I like the girl going wild song. So I was I would have probably had a good time at that, but yeah, there's that. Anyway. All right, guys. Okay, I gotta move on, y'all. We spent 30 minutes on music and I ain't even got to half my main topics. We'll come back to music at the end. All right. Um, OJ Simpson. Here we go. So, as we know, OJ Simpson recently passed away from prostate cancer, and it's crazy, I swear. Every time I take a nap, somebody passes on. That's why I was like, let me just stop taking naps. Because I remember when I moved home from college, I took a nap. And when I woke up, my dad was like, hey, your grandma died. What? Right? I remember I went to New York because I got invited to MTV. And while I was on the train, I was taking a nice little nap. When I woke up, Aretha had died. I'm like, Aretha? What? Lord. You know, holiday season. We didn't all ate. I didn't lay down, took a nap, and woke up, and, and Natalie Cole died. I'm like, I'm not taking no more naps. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going to just stay awake from now on. Just be like this 24 hours a day. Right? But um, when I think of OJ, um, the interesting thing is OJ to me reminds me of a time period where everybody still had a very collective experience. And what I mean by that, like if you've been following me, we've been saying this a lot on a lot of the lives. I just don't think society has collective experiences in the same way that we did in the past. And what I mean by that is I feel like we're less connected, but more connected now at the same time, right? OJ to me is a moment that kind of stopped in time. It's one of those where were you moments, everything from the, the Bronco chase and the trial and all that. And, you know, it, it's crazy because when all that happened, I was young. You know, I was, what was that, 94, 95? I was first or second grade, right? I was a little kid. I wasn't even paying attention to what was happening in the world like that. But, you know, it was crazy because 
thinking back, they literally interrupted an NBA Finals game, right, to show this this Bronco chase, this slow speed chase, right? And understanding, like, when we're talking collective experience, when that trial was happening, when I say that that was something everybody was talking about, it was like you go to the barbershop. I remember being in, like, the barbershop and hearing the adults talking about the case. You go into church. It was part of somebody's sermon, right? You were at school, you know, depending on if you were middle or high school, a lot of folks were watching the verdict on TV in school, right? You know, people that were going to work, it was the water cooler conversation. And of course, all of America was watching. I mean, this is something that literally helped to, you know, really kick off what you would call like, what was it, court TV? Right. When you're just talking about millions of people who chose to sit and watch the trial, it's just it was something that was was massive. And so when I think of collective experiences, that entire OJ trial situation was huge. Another thing I can think of from that time period in comparison, because it was, it was around the same time, would have been Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding with the ice skating thing, especially being in Washington State because they were just down the street in Oregon. It was really big where I was at. It was every five minutes you couldn't escape Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding news or whatever. Right. Um, and so, yeah. I think when we're talking about the OJ conversation, it really, to me, in 1992, now let's say 92, I'm thinking of the LA riots, my bad, in 94, 95, really kind of kicked back open that conversation on race, right? Because this is still the time period where they're trying to push the narrative that we're post-racial, right? They had really been pushing that because by the time you get out of the 70s going into the 80s, the way that education was starting to shift, everything is post-racial. We moved on. All the racism is over. We're all together in this, you know, all American melting pot, all that kind of stuff, right? But there would often be these different things that would always chip away at that narrative. And it was kind of like, you know, you had the LA riots in 92 and everything with Rodney King. So that kind of chipped away at that post-racial conversation. And, you, you know, the Tasha Harlan situation around the same time period, again, something that chips away at that, 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 water down the race conversation. And it was so funny because every time that they would always try to push this narrative of us being a post-racial country, there was always something happening. Even when you go 10 years before like the LA riots, you know, or maybe about 12 years before, you go back to 1980, we talked about the Liberty City riots in 1980, right? And it's so funny when you look at the logistics of how everything that happened at the Liberty City riots mirrored exactly what happened that led up to the 92 riots in LA as far as a situation of police brutality and, you know, the conversation around McDuffie and what the police did to him. It's just so interesting. So anyway, getting to my point, um, where OJ comes into this conversation OJ was one of the first prominent black public figures to kind of get this whimsical wrapping of safeness with white America. And what I mean by that, he had all these endorsements. You know, he has the Hertz commercials and this commercial and that commercial. He's doing the television. And, you know, he also was somebody who stayed away from the conversation of race. And so for a lot of people, they loved OJ because he came off as safe. He never talked about race. Uh, the only thing that you could associate race with him with was the opening of Roots. You know, he was in that first 30 minutes of the movie. That was about it. And even then, he was, you know, he was he was in the part of Roots before all the bad stuff happened, you know, in the good mood and he, he, great time. And he, passage to manhood kind of thing, right? And so, you know, OJ got the luxury of being somebody that was universally appealing. You know, there were only so many prominent black figures during that time period that got that kind of luxury coming into the 80s, early 90s. OJ was one of them. And then he played all the parts too, right? You know, and so it was just very interesting because, you know, you also got the whole, you know, you know, I'm not black, I'm OJ quote and all that kind of stuff, right? And so, it's just very interesting because I feel like the reason I enjoyed OJ a lot because it was mainly because he made white people feel comfortable again because again there was no conversation of race he wasn't about to shake the table they liked what oj represented at that time right they loved that because there's no element of having to feel accountable or responsible for any of the ills in the world but you can have somebody who's an anomaly that has made it and is likable and then he likes you and he likes your women right and so you know they loved 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 oj right <laughs> and then when everything went down right it was just kind of interesting how the U.S. went straight into code, right? All of that post-racial stuff went right out the window right away, right? As soon as that chase was on TV, it went straight from one half of the country's like, that MF is guilty. The other half is like, there's no way he did it. They trying to set him up, right? And the thing that's interesting as we talk about that case, because remember, this was like an 11-month case. It's on every channel. It is like 24-hour news cycle all night, all day. The thing about that OJ case, because, Lord, when you get into the conversation of whether he did it or not, I always say, before you can even get to that, you really can't even have a conversation about OJ unless you're going to talk about Mark Furman, right? Because to me, Mark Furman is the reason that you ended up getting the entire ending of how that case went out, right? Because for me, the entire case, you know, 
was a situation of race on display, right? And the reason I say that is Mark Furman, officer, part of the investigation, part of the crime scene, turns out he's racist, he's discovered he's racist, he's used the N-word, you know, he's even planted evidence at the scene, right? And then lied about it on the stand or lied about it in the deposition and during the investigation, right? Contaminated the crime scene, all kind of stuff. And then, you know, eventually when it's time for cross-examination and all these other things, because first of all, the prosecution was stupid for putting him on the stand anyway. Um, when they got to that part about, you know, have you had any racist thoughts about black people? And he had to say, I plead the fifth. You know, have you done anything to contaminate the crime scene or plant evidence? And he had to plead the fifth. I said that right there ended the case for the prosecution. Case over, because at the end of the day, you know, that alone kills any conversation about anything being beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Because again, the part, the burden of proof in a criminal case is again, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. Right then and there, the idea of a police officer planting evidence and contaminating a crime scene on top of just, and it's not just him, there's other folks in that LAPD that had other stuff going on, right? Once that's in the conversation, there's doubt. Automatically, there's no way you can convict anybody based on that alone, right? And mind you, again, 11 months of, of, of trial and deliberation and witness testimony and everything else like that, the case was already not handled well, it was already all over the place. And so, yeah, I just always find that funny because I'm like, Mark Furman, that the way that race kicks in, that, that racism just jumped in so much because he just couldn't resist, right? And I think some of that has to do with envy, you know, seeing this really successful black man, wealthy, beloved and everything. And then you're an LAPD officer probably making $30,000 at the time next to this millionaire. And, you you know, that envy, right? You already don't like somebody like an OJ. You don't think he deserves what he has. And here comes that rage and everything else. So I'm going to show him. And then you plant evidence. And I'm always like, I wonder what would have happened had Mark Furman not done his Mark Furman stuff. What Would we be having the same conversation? I don't know. As far as guilt and not guilty, I never really had an opinion on it, mainly because I was young. I was like, Again, first or second grade. Um, but again, it, it's just very interesting because I'm like, you know, Mark Furman, you you operated and played into that same role and look how that worked out for you, right? And it's interesting because then when the verdict comes out, you, you look at just the U.S. reaction, right? This goes back to that conversation of why I've never bought into the post-racial narrative because you saw exactly how things move. For a lot of white folks, they were like, oh, no, he only got off. This is just payback for the riots, and they just don't want another Rodney King, blah, 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 blah. That was their approach. A lot of black folks were looking at it more so like, you know, I see it more so that like the technicalities that have been created to protect white people actually worked and protected somebody black, right? Y'all corrupted this system and screw over so many people, but there's one of us who somehow was able to slip through the cracks, right? That's how that goes. I don't think a lot of people were, I don't think a lot of folks felt that he was innocent, but I think a lot of folks felt that, you know, again, going back to Mark Furman and the idea of trying to plant evidence and all that other stuff, that right there just, it tarnishes the whole case. And it's like any credibility, credibility that you may have had is out the window because now what are we supposed to actually believe? And so I think a lot of folks saw it that way. And then I think a lot of folks saw it like, finally, y'all can see what it feels like to be on the end where, because you saw a lot of white folks saying this is an injustice, the system is unjust. And it's like, there's a lot of black folks who are like, we've been telling y'all that forever and a day. But now that it's one of y'all, now all of a sudden you want to challenge the system because you didn't get what you wanted. But every single time we've talked about everything that's happened, whether it was, whether it was Arthur McDuffie in Liberty City back in the day, whether it was Rodney King, whether it was, you know, um, Letitia Harlins and everything else like that. And, and watching a woman who shot her in the back of the head, you know, get a suspended sentence and time served and she gets, gets to have her store, right? You know, all of these different situations where we saw these things happen and everybody kept saying it's something that black people did collectively wrong. And we watched these officers get off and get off and get off and get off and get off some more, right? And now finally, here's, an op here's, here's a, a moment where white America doesn't really get what they thought they were getting and here's the outrage. And so I think that opens the conversation and the dialogue around, you know, everything with OJ. That's how I've always looked at it, right? Like, man, because thinking back, like, even with Rodney King, what was so interesting with that, when that verdict came out, I always think back, there's like that Oprah episode, and, you know, Oprah's talking to different people in the audience. There's this white woman who probably is like 20 years old. I think she was a college student or something. She goes on this rant about, you know, we don't know what happened at the beginning of the video. Because remember the Rodney King video, um, the guy who was recording, he heard the commotion. He went to get his camera. And then by the time he turns the camera on, that's when the 
Rodney's getting beat up and everything, right? So there's no video footage of what led to that. But the woman is sitting here spending all her time like, yeah, that's, we don't know what happened in the beginning and something, something. And then the question becomes, but if something even happened in the beginning, does that equate to somebody getting whacked in the head with batons 56 times and kicked and ribs cracked? and face fractured, and I literally almost ripped out the socket, like all of that, like, you know what I mean? And so it was just interesting to see how people kind of looked at things. And so things like the LA riots and Rodney King and the OJ Simpson trial kind of put a crack into the narrative of the US is post-racial and we've moved on past race and everything like that. And we're all this great melting pot and everybody understands everybody's experience. Oh no, if anything, something like the OJ trial, something like Rodney King, something like the LA riots, open an even greater dialogue. But the sad part is rather than trying to remedy the issues, they just doubled down and pushed it even more instead of let's just really, you know, suppress these conversations. Let's just, and they, they kept running with this thing. And so we went through the rest of the 90s and early 2000s still with this narrative of us being a post-racial country, right? Until Barack Obama got in there and then white rage kicked back in. And then they came up with this narrative that he was the most divisive president. And he brought up conversations of racism. And racism. And I'm like, Barack did? Rock barely talked about race, but okay. Um, interesting. And now you see where we're at today as far as race. Just wild, right? But no, I feel like that conversation of a collective experience, that OJ trial is definitely one, right? And I think from that same time period, I'd also say the Oklahoma City bombing is one. I'd say TWA Flight 800 is one. That's a little bit later. That's 96. Um, and I'd also say even the Olympics in Atlanta with the bombing. That's another a moment that, again, just in the news 24 seven. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting to just kind of see how people kind of remember and reflect on things. I was kind of reading just some of the commentary I was seeing on social media, especially across generations to see, to see how people kind of interpreted different things. Very interesting because across generations, everybody has a different perspective and a different view on everything surrounding OJ. Interesting. All right, let me read some comments. Um, Oh, Y'all still in here talking music. Um, Let's see, where are we at here? I haven't got the Chick-fil-A yet. That's actually the next topic. Can't wait to get to that one. Oh, wait, this is still music. Still music. Okay, OJ, OJ. Um, course correction said, Calvin's naps are killing people. You got one <laughs> for TR, period, period, period. We can guess who that is. Let me stop. Let's see, let me cut back on the naps because, man... Oh, V, exactly. Y'all, I missed the solar eclipse. <laughs> he said, you took a nap and missed the solar eclipse. I certainly did. I was like, you know, because and, and it's so crazy because I was literally in Dallas. I should have stayed there because Dallas had the full eclipse, but I actually came back um, that Sunday. So I was back in D.C. for the, the eclipse. And um, man, I was like, OK, what time is this thing? OK, is it, it two? All right. I had just finished the meeting. And you know how sometimes when you're on those Zoom meetings, you get sleepy. I'm like, your eyes get tired. I was like, let me just lay down for like 20 minutes. I forgot to set my alarm clock. When I woke up, <laughs> it was like almost five o'clock. I was like, dang, man, the eclipse is over. I missed the whole eclipse, y'all. <laughs> A mess. All right. Um. Anyway. Yeah, I missed that. Oh, yeah. Mr. C died as well. The radio um, jockey out of New York. Afro and Gola said, so basically you enjoy Madonna's most R&B album to date, The Bedtime Stories. I like that one. I like um, the music album is cool because she there's some songs in there I like. The um, Runaway Lover song I like. She got a few songs I like here and there. Um, let me see. Somebody said, your dad texting your grandma died is still crazy to me. Yeah, he was trying to get with, this is like 2010. He was trying to fit in with the times, right? I just moved home from college. I didn't want to be back home. He was trying to speak the language he thought I spoke. And so when I woke up from the nap, it was like, hey, your grandma died, LOL. And his LOL, he thought they'd been like lots of love. And mind you, he's just upstairs. I went upstairs. Hey, grandma's gone? <laughs> like, man. Yeah, yeah, she, she, she went on to glory. Okay. All right. Let me see. Ayanna J said, Courtney B. Vance acted his ASS off as Johnny Cochran in The People vs. OJ. Phenomenal actor. That was a great series. I think I did, a, I did a review on that when it came out. That was really, really good. You should go back and watch that. I think it's on Netflix. The People vs. OJ, really, really good. Sterling K. Uh, Brown was good as um, Chris Darden. Um, what's the lady's name? She's in everything. 
Um, I don't know who I'm talking about. She did American Horror Story. She played Linda Tripp in the, the, the um, Clinton thing with Monica Lewinsky. I can't think of the lady's name, but y'all know who I'm talking about. She was a really good um, lawyer. Hold on, let me. This my mama. Hey, let me call you back. I'm on a live. All right. Good night. All right. Um, what is that lady's name? Um, dang. Oh, Sarah Polson or Polson. That that lady. Like she was really good as Marsha Clark. That's a really good watch. Oh, uh, let me see. Let's see. Um. All right. Getting to OJ. AJ here, 128, said, OJ was the pre-Will Smith Oscar slap of the 70s and early 80s, a.k.a. safe for whites. Black, black. Yeah, they loved him over there. Um, Harold Cordell, 11-month trial. My God, today. I would have lost it. I've had jury duty twice. And the longest one I had was a week. And that was torture. I, I told y'all before, it was a stupid case. I wanted to be on, like, a fun case. Like, put me on something where it's like, I don't know, I want some white-collar crime you know, it's some politician that did some scammeration. Like, I want to be a jury on that one because he's going to jail. No, nope. <laughs> you ain't even got to ask me, show me no evidence. Guilty, <laughs> right? But no, I had some boring case with some guy that already had like a, a high six figure job, and the company laid him off and he was suing for his bonus. And the bonus was like 120K. And at the time, I think I was, I was making no money. I'm sitting there with my little cute salary. In there annoyed watching this man complain about this bonus that he didn't get on top of he was making like 600k a year already right and so i was in there just longest case and we thought we had it figured out in two days and then there was one person who had a change of heart was like wait i don't know i don't know i'm like I thought we... <sighs> and then when we were like but we all said yesterday that this was what we thought and we were just gonna sleep on it and then lock it into today and the guy was like this is somebody's life i'm like no no you to me there's going to be a second trial in here. <laughs> but, um, man, we were in that case for a week. And then my car got towed because <laughs> the very last day when we finally were like, we got the verdict and everything. And the judge was like, well, we got to finish this because we're not coming back tomorrow. And like where I had parked after four o'clock, there's a certain street that turns into like it's rush hour. You can't do street parking there because I thought, you know, we we're just going to go there about nine o'clock, be out by 11 at the latest. Man, I got outside. I couldn't find my car. They had towed it. I was like, oh, this is stupid. So yeah, jury duty, I can't imagine being on that for 11 months. That is crazy. All right. Soul Flow said, yep, he said the N-word like 45 times. Yeah, Mark, I know they want to jump Mark in the back room. Like, you messed it up. You're not supposed to have us out in the open with our nonsense. That's supposed to be secretive. That's supposed to be behind the blue wall. All right? Let's see. It'll be interesting because you remember OJ was found liable in the civil suit. So I wonder what's gonna happen with that money because that, that the family never got a dime. And now I know they're about to fight and claw for whatever OJ has left. I don't think he has a whole lot, but I'm sure they're about to snatch and get what they can get. All right. Um and then I've seen there's been a few different like conspiracies around what really happened. Some people think it was his son, some people think it was like a mob situation um uh, especially with um the, the boyfriend that also got killed with the cold brown i don't know i just like i said i was so young but uh yeah david main says selective outrage is real exactly I don't know what happened to Cato. Cato was trying to be an actor, right? I don't know where Cato went. Cato was so high and loopy, he'd have missed the whole thing. Somebody getting stabbed up outside, he ain't hurt, barely heard anything. Like, Cato, what you doing? Right? Um, Man. Thank you, I am Leah. Oh, to catch this live, um, been waiting. Congrat congratulations on almost 72K subs. Well done, Calvin. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um. I just think there's some cases we'll we'll never really know the full outcome of. You know, so be it. All right, I want to move on. My phone is like blowing up today. I don't know if you can hear it vibrating, but like every two seconds, I'm like, y'all, my phone be dry all day. Let me get on the live. Everybody hitting you. Hey, <laughs> right? Oh, okay. Anyway, I need another. Where's my tea? That's what I grab one of that instead of this water. Damn, I just spilled some. All right, let me get to Donald Trump and his Chick Fil A trip. All right, so 
Orange Man. And so I saw there was a video that had gone viral, and this has kind of been a topic of conversation for the last few days. But there was a video that had gone out, and it shows the former president doing a pop-up visit at a Chick-fil-A. It's kind of presented as he shows up unannounced and he buys everybody milkshakes. And it's just this great time with the black employees who just love Trump and love what he's done. And it was just a great time. He's hugging the people. It was a great time. This is in Atlanta. This is around the AUC, that whole, that triangle, right? Clark, Morehouse, Spellman, and Morris Brown is down the street, like that whole region. And it was just a great time, right? By the way, um, Tareen Reloaded kind of talked about this on his channel yesterday. Um, he kind of went a lot more in depth than I'm going to go. So definitely check out his video on this. But um, yeah, so that's kind of what it was. Right. And so that was the the, the video and everybody kind of pushes us into that narrative that, again, there's this narrative that's being put out there that Trump is gaining massive support from the black community. I mean, massive, like 30 percent support, right? That's kind of been the narrative that's being pushed out there. Like he, you know, Biden is losing the black vote. The Democrats are losing the black vote and black folks are tired. So they're, they're so tired that they decided to jump to the other extremity. So they're going to the Trump side, right? That's kind of been the narrative that's been pushed. When in reality, the way I, as much as I can't stand this political season, I'm like, get us through November already. Cause I'm, I'm like, I'd like to see these numbers. Personally, I don't see Trump getting 30% of the black vote. Not at all. I could see maybe 15, maybe a max of 18, right? You know, amongst black women in November, 5 to 10%. Black men, 11 to 17. I don't see no 30. I don't see it. But anyway, um, but there's there's been this narrative to kind of paint the picture that black Americans are swarming to get behind Trump, you know, and there's just all these things that he's done. That he he's just so relatable to us. So God damn it, man! It's, oh, yeah, leave me alone. All right. Um, that he's done all these things that are just so you know he can connect with the black folks. So there, there's the shoes he's come out with. And you saw the whole narrative where they were like, yeah, man, he um he came out with these shoes and black people love sneakers and that's why he can relate to the people. He's so cool, right? And then he even said, you know, I can relate to you because they, they I got 91 counts against me and you guys know about the judicial system, you know, all these different things. And then you have like groups like Blacks for Trump. And I always think of the Michael Simonette guy. If you've ever paid attention and you watch a Trump rally, there's always this one guy. He has this really pretty grade of hair, right? And it's always tied back. And he's this black dude that always has the white shirt with the Blacks for Trump. And he like every Trump rally, he's right in that same spot. No matter where he goes, you always see him, right? And they kind of use him as like the token Negro to say, yeah, let's see. Look at all these Trump supporters. So they've been kind of pushing that, right? And um, my thing, actually, I'm going to say my thing in a second. But anyway, getting to my point. So that's kind of been the narrative that has been pushed. So then out of nowhere, boom, here's the surprise visit at Chick-fil-A, right? And the narrative, again, like we said, he shows up unannounced and he brings the 30 milkshakes and people were excited. And so I'm watching this clip, especially when it gets to the girl who's hugging him. And it was like, you know, you know, mama, I made it. And no matter what the media says, we support you. And I was watching like, hmm. and again, there are black Trump supporters. I, I don't take that away from Trump. He has his, his following. There's even some people who follow me are black Trump, black Trump supporters and will probably say it on here. And so I was like, this is interesting right because as the woman kept talking i was like okay this doesn't sound like a regular car because you know she's like you know we 100 support you and you did the most for hbcus not biden and blah 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 blah. and you know i don't care what the media says i said this is starting to sound a little plantish right starting it ain't really sounding like a natural conversation from somebody who's just in a chick-fil-a getting some food right I'm going to say my two cents on that visit in a second but you know it was just interesting and then you know he's like you know oh, i gotta give you a hug and everybody's screaming and clapping Saying, hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Mm hmm. Mm. See where this is about to go. So I was like, let me just sit around for a few days and see how this rolls out. Because for me, I was like, okay, something about this is coming off a little too staged. This is a little too well prepared, right? And so, boom, you get the research, right? So the woman in that video with the black and pink braids who's hugging all over Trump and doing all the other stuff, lady named Michaela Montgomery, right? And she is the city director for the Atlanta chapter of Blexit or the Blexit Foundation. We know Blexit because who do we just talk about on that other video that got me a whole bunch of new subscribers? Candace Owens, right? That's Candace Owens and Brandon, uh, Brandon Tatum's. They, they were a part of that. So I'm like, oh, okay, right. And then you know that Blexit is also under Turning Point USA. That's um, Charlie Kirk's little company group. So I'm like, okay, this is all some right wing 
type of thing where one, the goal is pull in Gen Z, especially black Gen Zers. And if you can get a few millennials that can hop over and everything else like that. And the whole Blexit Foundation, the idea of like black people exiting what they like to call the Democrat plantation. They love to use that phrase, right? Jump from one plantation to the other one, I guess. Right. And so I was like, this is interesting. And so once I saw that, you know, she was there, I was like, actually, all of this is set up. And then when you look at it, pretty much it's a photo op, like everything is, right? Um, and I think one of the things that they're trying to do is in the event that Trump loses in November, the idea of pushing a narrative that the election is rigged because Trump had all this black support, there's no way that it was still the setup where still after all of this, 80 plus percent of black people voted for Biden. There's just no way. This is rigged. It will jump into if this man tries to do another January 6th stolen election type thing in the event that he loses, right? That's kind of what you see happening, right? Because even when you read the comments on the video, please go to one of these videos and read the comments. It's the funniest thing. You see all these white folks on there like, oh my God, you just see how happy the staff is. I mean, they're they're, they're mesmerized by this man. I mean, they're, they're literally melting in his arms. I'm like, Lord, Lord, Lord. And that helps to push that narrative because those same people are going to be the ones that are like, yeah, we know the thing is rigged because when we saw that clip, they were, they were excited that Orange Man was in there. He he gave them free milkshakes. You know, they're all working at, at Chick-fil-A, work, making whatever they make, because I know minimum wage in Georgia ain't that high, but they're making what they make, and he gave them free milkshakes. Everybody in there. And so I was like, okay. Now, now here's the thing. As someone who lives in D.C. and has met a few presidents, especially, again, having a community center and having a community center that had high accolades and acclaim, my center was always getting called to be a part of something. One thing I've learned is the president never does pop-ups. No presidents do pop-ups because it's too much of a security risk. And by the way, this is not to say that staging an event is something only pertinent to Trump because every president does it, every last one. That's just how they move. But the idea that Trump would just randomly be in this section of this section of Atlanta, this section of Atlanta, right, <laughs> just randomly popping up and going to Chick-fil-A. Oh, I'm hungry. Let's get some Chick-fil-A. And then there's this whimsical environment where everybody's so happy to see him and all of the staff are excited and, and standing in line and just a great time. And out of nowhere, Michaela just happens to be there and she got her group and has her, her talking points ready. It never happens that way. Let me just speak from experience. So um, the, most, the, the most recent time that we met the president was 2022. Oh, actually, former president, it was Barack Obama. But um, this is supposed to be my podcast later down the line. But oh, well, y'all getting a free preview. But anytime a president goes to any kind of location, everything has to be cleared by Secret Service before there's ever even a visit. If you live in D.C., you kind of see that sometimes when they have the motorcade. Like if you've ever watched them prepare for a motorcade five, ten minutes before the president comes down with all the 50,000 limos and bikes and all the other stuff. You watch all these different police come. They're checking trash cans for bombs and everything. They're clearing off the sidewalks. They're blocking off the streets. They're blocking off all the cross streets and everything. And then after that 15 minutes, everything was clear. Here comes the motorcade. And he he might, actually, they don't wave no more. They don't learn from Kennedy. Keep the windows closed. Keep the top up, right? And, you know, they, they, go, they go on down and they, they're done. And then when they clear out, I forgot how many feet they need to be before they start undoing everything. And then they do the undoing, right? So the last time that we met the president, I got a call about a week and a half before this specific event, right? And they don't tell you it's the president because for security purposes, they'll never say, oh, the president is coming next Thursday because they don't know if I'm going to be some person who comes on my YouTube like, hey, y'all, the president is going to be at this on t Tuesday, and I just said that in front of 800 people or something like that. That's not going to be a thing. So a lot of times they'll just tell you important dignitary will be visiting or you're going to be visiting this person or blah, 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 blah. And the next thing they do is they give you clearance. You need to get clearances for everybody who's supposed to be a part. So anytime that we ever had to have kids that were going to either stand behind the president for signing a bill or if the president was coming to the center or we're doing anything, the kids are already pre-selected. Right. It's it's not like they're walking in and it's all these random kids just happy jump. It's already pre-arranged, pre-selected. Right. And so they do the pre-selection. You as the staff member, your job is to get all this information from the parents. And at the same time, they're telling you to try to not tell the parents what they're going to see, because that's another challenge. It's security risk because parents talk as well. You tell my son about to see Obama. So none of that. Right. And so you get all this clearance information. You got. And I mean, Parents' information, address, phone number, health records, the kids' information, blah, 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 blah. And Lord, if somebody got a different last name from their parents, it's another whole step. You go through all of that, 
right? Then you probably get called into another meeting later down the line. This is after they've already approved you to go and your selected amount of whoever that's going to get to go. Then you have another meeting. They tell you exactly what's going to happen. They tell you what time you have to be somewhere, where you're going to be. A lot of times you have to be there hours before. So when we did the last visit, it, it was it was with Barack Obama. We were on this Today Show some years back in 2022. And we had to be at Great Falls Park because this is when Barack Obama had the Netflix um, National Park thing he was having. So he was promoting this on the Today Show. We had to be at Great Falls because it was him and our worker. We had to be there at 6 a.m., I think. And Barack and crew weren't going to be there till like 1 o'clock, right? <laughs> so imagine me with a bus full of kids and we sitting there for five hours. <laughs> I'm trying to keep them entertained, right? And, and just in case anybody thinks I'm lying, because I know folks be like, can be up here slicing up stuff? I, look, I, I can't show the video because I got to protect the identity of the children, but I can play the audio of them finding out that they're meeting the president really quick. Let's see. I always keep that one because that was my favorite clip of the kids. Um, this is one of my last parting gifts before I left. Um, here, you'll get the audio. Let's see. Um, by the way, um, hold on. Before I play that. This is the kids finding out who they're meeting because I couldn't tell them who they're like. I found out it was the president, I think, the night before, um, but I couldn't tell the kids till they got there, right? And then the lady from NBC just did it. This is what this is. All right. Okay, so anyway, yeah, they got to meet Obama. But anyway, getting to my point. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's never a situation where the president <clears throat> will do a last minute pop-up unannounced. It's just too much of a security threat, even when it's an ex-president or a former president, right? And so as soon as I saw that, I was like, yeah, this is all stage. And my theory would be everybody that was in that Chick-fil-A was already pre-approved. Even the ones who worked there, most likely they probably also did a thing where the staff that were selected, they probably were already told how to act and everything, because that was the other thing. We It wasn't just Barack Obama for my center. One time they tried to have us do something with Ben Carson. I was like, oh my God, anybody but Ben Carson, please. And let me tell you how trifling it was, right? So, you know, my center was at a public housing complex. And remember, Ben Carson was trying to gut HUD and cut it and chop it down, right? And man, right? So out of nowhere, I get a call and it's like, Ben Carson is coming to your center. I'm like, oh, what? Why? For those who don't know, I live in the D.C. area, so you're always getting all of these calls and stuff. I'm like, why? Why? Like, I just, like, because I got the call at work, and I couldn't scream because the kids are in there. I just went in one of the back rooms and closed the door. Why? Of all people, if you know, Ben is somebody I don't rock with, right? And so... They gave me all these stipulations. They were like, you got to make sure you have kids who are going to behave. Make sure you have kids who do this. Make sure blah, 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 blah. No politics. And then they wanted to vet my center. Now, understand, my center was blackity black, black, black. We had all kind of Malcolm X posters on the wall and, you know, all kind of black prominent figures from all aspects of life. Mary Clayton on the wall, because I'm like, you know what? They don't give black background vocalists enough shine. And, you know, I got the Jacksons on one of the walls. I had Spike Lee and John Singleton and Patrice Lamoon, but like all these different people on the wall. Like, they were like, all that got to come down. <laughs> you got to take all that stuff off the walls. Oh, I was like, man. And I remember I was like, before I, and they don't let you say yes or no. They, they're like, you ain't got an effing choice pretty much is how they really say it. And I was like, I would just like to have a conversation with this man before he gets to come in here. Because the idea was he was going to show up, do this whole speech about how pulling yourself up from the bootstraps, you can make it and be great. And then the idea was going to be highlighting my center and the great accolades it's had and where all of these kids are going to end up going in the future and how something like public housing or Section 8 is not a lifestyle. It's just something that helps you go along the way, but you're not supposed to be dependent upon it. That was the, the, the aim. Fortunately, him, his, remember his wife got in trouble with that dining room set that they used the tax dollars on? That was the same week. <laughs> so Ben was canceled and I was in that room like, Right. I remember Mike Pence was supposed to be at one of our events. Same situation. So getting to my point. Um, yeah, there's never a situation where there's this magical pop up where a politician just shows up unannounced. And this is always going to be prearranged, always. And so Michaela had been known that, you know, she probably got a call from everything. They probably told Michaela a week ahead of time. Trump is going to be in the AU. 
understand that that Chick-fil-A was probably closed off to the rest of the students in the area. Nobody else was allowed in there except for people that were pre-approved, which is why everything kind of looks so presented, which is why all the staff are standing at almost at attention across the, the, the register and everything else like that. Yeah, there, there's no thing where presidents get to just show up. It's too much of a security risk, right? Michelle Obama talked about how one time, you know, this is when the, the Supreme Court case was happening with the same-sex marriage. And, you know, it had been, you know, it had become law of the land. And Michelle was talking about how her and I think the oldest daughter, uh, Malia, wanted, or maybe it was Sasha, wanted to celebrate. And they, all they wanted to do was just step out the back door and kind of celebrate because people were at the White House and all. And security, <laughs> Secret Service would not let her go outside. They're like, no, get that's back in the house, right? So yeah, it, it's it's a serious game out there. But getting to my point, all of this is so extra, right? Because the narrative of trying to paint these politicians to be heroes or people, like I, we're just at a, such a slippery slope, right? And I've always said, like, we have to get into the space where politicians are here to serve. They are not our saviors. They should not be our superheroes. We should not get to the point where we start becoming people outside of ourselves to appease a politician or to try to look a certain way. I just thought that was stupid. And especially, um, yeah, the part where she was talking the um, bit about the HBCUs, I'm like, y'all, and then just be up here lying. I want to clear that up too, because I'm tired of people saying that, because people say that on this channel, right? Um, and this is not me trying to vouch for one for Biden versus Trump, but I, I'm just like, if y'all going to start telling stuff, I need the facts to be there. Let's not just start saying things. So there's been this rumor floating around for like the last few years that Biden had yanked away you know, $30 billion from HBCUs and Trump was the only one who cared about HBCU, blah, 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 blah. So let's clear some things up. What did Trump do? Let me just read the article really quick or the piece of it. Um, the president's brief comment, this is about Trump. The president's brief comment appeared to refer to bipartisan legislation dubbed the Future Act that the U.S. Congress passed in December. The legislation made permanent $255 million in annual STEM funding for minority serving colleges, including roughly $85 million specifically allocated to HBCUs. $85 million specifically allocated to HBCUs. Now, that may sound like a lot of money. There are over 100 HBCUs. Howard's endowment alone is $855 million. But I will say kudos for the $85 million. Kudos for locking in something that was already going to be law anyway, because it's just something they vote on every year. Cool to that. And I will also give credit because they also did help to secure an additional $200 million for the United Negro College Fund. Great. That's where it stops. That's that's what Trump was able to do for HBCUs. Now, going to the other side, Biden-Harris administration has taken historic actions to support HBCUs, including investing $7 billion into HBCUs, which includes $3.6 billion for HBCUs through the American Rescue Plan and other COVID relief, and $1.6 billion in capital finance debt release for 45 public and private HBCUs. In addition to that, this is where that random $30 million comes from that people keep talking about that, you know, the Biden administration got rid of or something, that money was never there to begin with, right? This was just the second half of the Build Back Better plan. Remember that we had Build Back Better one and two. One got passed and then two was gonna be an additional $3.5 trillion added to the budget. It was gonna do a bunch of different things for the economy, for infrastructure. And within that, there was gonna be proposed 30 to $45 million, 30 to $45 billion for HBCUs. What happened to that? Well, Republicans said we're not. That's ridiculous. We're not. They, we're not doing it. That's stupid. That's crazy. That's crazy. So they had to keep negotiating and negotiating and cutting and cutting and cutting. And y'all already know how this works. When it gets time to cut and stuff, who's the first group that's always getting chopped? Us, right? So then, what was proposed to be thirty to forty-five billion dollars got chopped down to two billion additional funds added. But you know what? The bill never went to the Senate floor because the Senate would not take it up because who was majority leader in the Senate at the time? Mitch McConnell. It was never voted on and that funding never came. That's what happened with the money. So this narrative of they yanked 30 or $40 billion out of the HBCU, that money was never there. That was a proposed dream bill. No administration before that ever had that kind of money even about an HBCU. Barack's team didn't do it. Bush's team didn't do it. Clinton's didn't do it. Bush number one didn't do it. Reagan didn't do it. Carter didn't do it. Ford didn't do it. I can keep going back. Nixon didn't do it. We just go all the way back, right? Kennedy, Johnson, none of them did that, right? And so it's interesting. That's why I'm always like, be careful with some of the narratives that y'all hear out there because folks will come out here and say anything, right? So yes, to Trump's credit, he did secure the $85 million or 85, um, yeah, $85 million. It's a part of a bigger $200 million bit, but that's for minority serving institutions, not specifically lined item for HBCUs. But yes, Trump gave the $85 million and supported the 200 million for UN, UNCF.
that's the extent of that. So in total, we're going to say about $280 million. If I want to be very, very generous and include the minority serving institutions, $480 million versus $6.7 billion. So let's get the numbers right, folks. Let's not just start saying stuff, right? Um, but it's interesting because you are see people who do things that are like super overperformative. That was kind of my beef with the Michaela lady. I was like, why are you so overperformative about this? Like, it goes back to what I was saying, how I don't think we should be fans of any politician. Best believe, if I met Biden, if you think I'm about to be hugging all up on him and you know, I, I just thank you for what you No, I got probably got some words for the man, to be honest. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I just think it, it's interesting because all of that overperformativeness never gets you anywhere. Right. It makes me think of even remember Diamond and Silk. Right. Right. And remember the, the Stump for Trump sisters or the Stump for Trump girls. And they would go to these rallies and get to all that, you know, he don't build that wall. And let me tell y'all something. And what did she say? You know, if anybody got something to say about Trump, you send them to me. Right. And now one of them ain't even here no more. And Trump didn't even remember the lady's name. But, you know, there's that. I'm like, it just doesn't really get you anywhere. But anyway, going back to what I said, these presidents are not our heroes. They are in there to maintain a status quo that's already there. Our job is to get the most we can get out of them while they're in office from their administration and anybody else that's in power, because every four years, everything recycles and somebody else comes in there. And, and while people are in there, they try to submit and lock things in. The best bet is to try to get the most you can out of whoever's in office. Right. And so, like I said, we're in this very slippery slope where politics has become so draconian and tribal that people literally worship the ground these politicians walk on. And this is why we're now in this space where you hear people always talking about civil war and you know we're gonna uprise i just watched this random clip that is this white woman who was talking about well if trump doesn't win she's just gonna die she's just ready to die the country's just too bad and then the guy asked her like well what's so bad about it and she started talking about the shoplifting in california and i'm like so you want to die because of that right especially when we just saw that whole story about how all of them snatching grabs in california were tied to a white couple that was organizing the whole thing with millions of dollars in stolen stuff that they were shipping off and reselling right and you saw who they made to face all that crime. A mess. Anyway, I've said enough. Let's read some comments. Imagine dying for one of these politicians. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. Yeah, but like I said, all these presidents have these, these, these staged visits. Like, man, it's not even a shock. But it's just like, don't play in my face like we just stupid, like you randomly went in there and it, you just you just dragged the mess out of Atlanta a year ago when you, you lost the election and had all this stuff to say. Now all of a sudden Atlanta's, you know, you, these are my people. All right, Trump. Okay. Anyway. Let's see here. Oh, y'all talking about jury duty? Oh, what up, Turing Reloaded? Speaking of um said oj put a pause to that family getting a dime he said that goes to my heirs kids and the grandkids oh yeah they're, they're gonna be in court fighting about that man and i felt like when oj did go to jail i felt like that was payback they were getting their pay they were getting their licking with that one remember because his stuff was being auctioned and then he, he went in there to try to get it back <clears throat> no they gave what did they give him? i don't remember how big the sentence was but it was at least like 15 years right they were ready to get him they couldn't wait Oh, Kale turned into the I can't believe it's not butter guy. You mean like the, the 90s commercials where he'd be like, I can't believe it's not butter. That was him? Okay. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Karen Sherman said, see, if those people were watching you, they would know not to call you right now. Exactly. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. <laughs> Somebody they always hit me up. I and mean, they'd be like trying to FaceTime. I'm like, dang, wait a minute. Okay. And somebody said Biden and the Dems never kept their promises. Honestly, none of these people keep their promises. Like when you really look at what every politician promises to do, maybe 10% of it gets done. For Orange Man, his thing, well, even though it kind of happened after he got out of office, this is why I always say, like, your your vote is kind of your legacy, right? And so his biggest thing right now would be Roe v. Wade overturning that. But a lot of times, he only get one or two major pieces of legislation done. So with Barack Obama, his would have been the Affordable Care Act. Um, what else would I throw in there? A um, few other things. If Same-sex marriage, even though that's probably something that's you know, on the docket with this current Supreme Court. There's that. Um, 
you know, kind of pulling us out of the recession. Those are probably his main three things I could think of. Um, for the Trump era, like we said, Roe v. Wade. Um, oh, I'll also, also say um, Barack also gave, gave us sort of mayor on the Supreme Court. And I think one other justice, Trump gave us the three justices that uh, Kavanaugh, Amy, and who else did we get? I forgot one other person. Um, what else is with Trump's legacy? I don't know what else he's done that didn't drive him crazy. Biden's thing will be, again, pulling us out of the recession after COVID. Um, probably the Build Back Better plan is probably one thing. But yeah, these, none of these people make half the promises they put out there. I wish politicians, honestly, would just be upfront. I need a politician to run for office and be like, listen, it's an S-word show right now. I can't promise I'm going to do all this, but this is what I would like to do. And this is how I'm going to try to do it. And if you support me, this is, this is, I think people need to see the process along the way. When these politicians show up with these big dream, whimsical stances and platforms and everything looks like it's just going to be Skittles and rainbows all day, right? And then we get into the era and it ain't no Skittles and rainbows. It's, it's candy corn and, 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 and what's the orange peanuts, the nasty ones. Those marshmallow peanuts, um, circus peanuts. You know, when it's that, it's like, wait a minute, I mean, you told me skills and like recent pieces, what are you, candy corn, you know. So I feel like if they could be more upfront, I think that's where a lot of these folks make big flaws. They over exaggerate the accomplishments. And so, like, I never want to hear about the economy doing well and you're measuring it based on the stock market. That's not reality for most people. The stock market, we may, a lot of us have money in the stock market, most likely our 401ks, but most of us don't have big money in the stock market. When I'm saying big money, I'm talking the upper half of six figures. Not Most of us don't have that. So when they start talking about the stock market doing this, I'm like, that ain't really helping a lot of us, right? Stuff like that to me does not help, right? Lazy. Serenity Joy, the extra info was it was staged. Yeah, exactly. Um, what up? Don't shadow ban me, YouTube. <laughs> That's their name. All right. Um, Somebody said they're going to pull another January 6th. You know, I don't think we realize, I know I always bring up January 6th and I never shut up about it. I don't think people realize how much of a threat to national security that is, that the whole world saw how easy it was to get into such a federal building. I just know places and, and folks that really hate the U.S. that are already plotting our demise, they have studied that. <laughs> They've taken notes, Right. They they said, oh, we didn't know it was this easy to get up in there. We thought, you know, psh, understand. All right, <laughs> man. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um. Yes, y'all. Ben Carson, of all people. All people, Lord. Pison Beauty said, could you reject the visit? Um, not really. Nonprofit world, we always need visibility and all this other crap. And sometimes these people show up and promise us things and then they still don't do it, right? Um, oh, because oh, one time, let me tell y'all, this wasn't my kids though, but Ivanka Trump used to volunteer at one of the nearby centers. And like she was trying to keep like a low profile. So she would purposely do it where there's no media and everything like that. But it was so bad. No parent wanted their kids there. They had to literally like bus in kids from a different center to pretend to be kids from that center because they just could not get kids to participate. And then somehow we got pulled into some nonsense. There was a, um, what is it called? Workforce Advisory Board meeting. There's this, this is a meeting that takes place with all the top CEOs around the country, right? And they meet with all the top government folks and everything like that. Somehow we got pulled into this crap to be, we, they need the kids to be ambassadors, right? And we were told that you're probably gonna be in there with some political figures that you may not be excited over. And I fought and clawed, I didn't wanna do that one, but we ended up in it. But it, it was just, it was interesting because Ivanka Trump was also with that. And I just always remember she went up to one of my kids and was like, oh, I met you before. And the girl's like, no, you didn't. And she said that crap so loud. I was like, 
Woo, but that day, CNN was there. I was trying to hide. I didn't want to be on the cameras. <laughs> uh, I, that's an aspect that I don't miss of, of that work. I loved working in the community, but they would use us as pawns sometimes. I hated it. Um, anyway. Tyler Hackner says, celebrity worship is bad enough. Politician worship is even worse. Exactly. Man, it, the more I think, and because somebody said this in one of my comments, they're like, you say all this, but what about all the folks who had like Barack Obama hats on and stuff? I'm like, yeah, there was a lot of aunties and grandmas who were like, yeah, we love Barack and everybody had his little hats and stuff. But Barack was not going to be able to get nobody to go and storm the Capitol on January 6th, right? If he would have said, you know, let's let's just say Barack lost in 2012 for the reelection. Nobody was showing up to storm the Capitol for Barack Obama. We weren't crazy because we knew the government would have sniped all of us out. Everybody, choo, 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 choo. That, look, that would have been a different January 6th. It wouldn't have been like 2021. Like, we, we if folks would have tried to show up and storm the Capitol for Barack in 2012, first of all, they would have even made it to the grass, okay? That all you know, the U.S. Capitol Police and Secrets, they would have been sniping folks. We, it would have been just like higher learning when Tyra was running and pop. Everybody, please. Yeah, I was like, listen, when Obama's time was up, we said, all right, it was a good run. We see you later. And we moved on to the next. There wasn't no rigged election and this, that, and the third, and, and years later, and there wasn't a let's go Brandon or a special phrase. We just were annoyed with who the choice was, but nobody was going to jail over none of these politicians. Please. Man. Anyway. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. You could add the student loan forgiveness to Biden's bid. That's one of the things that's been happening. One of my co it, in the podcast, Ava actually got her um, loans forgiven, which was really cool. And if anybody deserved it, it was definitely her. Um, all right. Um, let us keep it moving. Yeah, I, I can't wait for this election to be over. Y'all know I'm so sick of politics. It's just draining to sit with. And to just see how so many are in this space where it, I think our politics has gotten so one-dimensional and people are very reactionary. It's like a very, it's a seesaw, right? It's one or the other. And it, there's never this space to have nuance and really like, let's look at the policy. Let's see what this policy does. Let's look at cause and effect. And so this is a weird space we are in. Very weird. Very weird. Somebody said, do I play basketball? I ain't played basketball since elementary school, but I was actually okay. One of my podcast episodes I talk about when I played. Um, all right. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Oh, God. Israel and Iran. My God. All right. I'm going to be quick with this one. Um, as far as Israel and Iran, I... I don't know why we are so tied to this. And I get it. There's, uh, I don't like saying these phrases, but there is definitely a certain order that saturates, saturates around the world. I don't like saying world order because it sounds like I'm a part of the nonsense. But I, I get it. There are alliances and treaties and all these kind of things that all these countries have signed. But I'm sorry. Netanyahu is freaking crazy. Netanyahu is just the Israeli version of Trump. Right? And Netanyahu is going to get a whole lot of folks killed. You see he already killed all these people in Gaza. But like... My thing is, if Joe has any common sense, do not pull us into this mess with Israel and Iran, right? Um, it's also kind of nerve-wracking to live in the nation's capital and all this stuff be going down, because sometimes you kind of just be like, any minute now, they'd be a great white flash, because if people start coming to attack the U.S., I know D.C. is one of the first places they're going to go after, D.C., New York, L.A., right? <laughs> and so I'd be like, Lord. But, you know, the thing that, I don't know. Going back, right? So April 1st, there's the bombing in Syria, and it hits the Iranian embassy. To me, that right there, what are y'all doing? First of all, an embassy is not a place of war. An embassy is there to handle logistics and issues, right? You go to a foreign country, you lost your passport, something happened. You need to prove that you're a U.S. citizen, so you go to the U.S. embassy in that country, and they say, oh, okay, let's look up your information, and then they kind of set you up to help you get into your situation, and you're good to go. Or you marry somebody in one of these countries, and it's not the best marriage, and you're trying to get out, but they have all your documentation, because, I don't know, they're holding you hostage or something. You go to the U.S. embassy to get the support and everything. Like, that's what that's for. So look at it as if 
think back to when America used to still have multi-generational homes with families. So like, like the Waltons, right? You know, you had mom, dad, grandpa, aunts, uncles, kids, cousins, nieces. Like just imagine there's this big house with all these relatives in there and all the cousins keep fighting. The embassy is grandma's room upstairs. Everybody goes up to grandma's room to handle the stuff. Grandma eases it on out and then everybody gets a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and goes back outside and plays and everything's good. So why are you guys bombing an embassy? They're, that's all civilians, right? So y'all literally bomb this, well, they have not taken responsibility for it, but it is, it is alleged that this was an Israeli bombing, right? They bombed an embassy in Iran. So Iran is like, oh, I got something for y'all. So they said, well, we're going to retaliate, right? And then here comes the retaliation. Boom, boom, boom. Some more bombs are dropped. And at this point, that was eye for an eye. For me, I'm like, all right, y'all even. We done. We're going to move on with, with life now. But Israel is like, nope, uh-uh, y'all. We're we going to retaliate. Now, Joe has already said. U.S. will not be supporting Israel if they do any kind of attack or strike. And the reason why is because it's a very slippery slope. The problem is, especially for Israel, Israel sits in a space and is surrounded by everybody that hates them, right? You know, they are the neighbor that nobody wants to deal with. Every neighbor got smoke for them for something that they have done. And mainly, I don't know why Israel put Netanyahu back in the office after they he got in trouble with corruption and everything. Because Understand Netanyahu is moving in a space that is not good for Israel. It's for him and his ego, right? He's just doing whatever he wants to do, right? But understand that because of that un that instability, right? Right on deck over there is Russia, is China, there's North Korea, and everybody's just waiting for somebody to, to, to jump. We've been in this space of frogginess for like the last 10 years, right? And on one side is the U.S., Israel, U.K., EU, on the other side, you have Russia kind of doing their thing, and they've kind of they're kind of more aligned with China than the U.S. is, and Russia is also more aligned with North Korea than the U.S. is. But then the U.S. is also tied in with everything with Taiwan because the U.S. signed a treaty back in '97 claiming that they were always going to protect Taiwan from China. This is before China became what it is now, right? Understand, China in 1997 is very different from China in 2024. So we're still tied to that treaty. When you talk about the whole Ukraine thing, the, the negotiation was Ukraine. You guys get rid of your nuclear weapons and everything like that. We'll always protect you. We'll protect you from Russia. So now we're still tied to that with Ukraine. Russia wants Ukraine back because it used to be in the Soviet Union. It's like all these issues tied together. So it's this complex web of a bunch of BS because at the end of the day, the people, you and I, are all collateral to the nonsense. None of us have beef with any of these folks because none of us know any of these people. Like I don't have beef with anybody from Russia because I don't know nobody from there, right? Um, so on and so forth. Now, I do have an issue with what is happening to the, the citizens that are being bombed by larger governments and their leadership and the choices that they're making. I do have an issue with what's happened to the people of Gaza. I do have an issue with what's happening to people all around the world in regard to larger governments doing different things where the people are collateral. All of that, I'm not cool with. But we are in a slippery slope where everybody is just waiting for somebody to jump. And Netanyahu happens to be the crazy cousin in the family that ain't got nothing to lose. Well, they got everything to lose, but they are so unhinged they don't care and they will burn this whole ish down, right? They're ready, right? So that's where we're at. And so now we're all kind of on pins and needles. Like, is Israel about to go back and retaliate against Iran for responding to an attack that is allegedly from Israel to begin with? Right. And mind you, Israel's been kind of shooting drones and stuff all around anyway. Right. They, they be cooking everybody all the time. And then us as a government continue to fund them and give them three point eight billion dollars every year. Um, it's an interesting time. I'm just like, do not drag us into this mess. We can't go to war with everybody. And I think the beef that I have with our politicians. Right. This is not 1991 anymore. The era of painting the big, bad boogeyman and we must go and help and do something. Those days are gone. Younger Gen Xers are not buying it. Millennials are not buying it. Gen Z is not buying it. Even Gen Alpha be like, we see through the BS, right? And so the days of painting the narrative of the U.S. has to go and save somebody, it, it's just not a thing anymore. It's not because we've just seen how many times we ended up in like proxy wars and all kind of other things. So it's like, no, it's just not the same. So y'all got to try something different, right? Um, and I think that's the, the challenge because there's a disconnect between what our government is doing and what the people are asking for. Most people right now wouldn't be able to tell you what the beef is in a lot of these countries because we're trying to figure out how to pay our bills. We're trying to figure out how to pay off student loans. We're trying to buy a house in a housing market that is just freaking crazy right now. You know, there's a situations around everything happening with the high cost of health care and everything else like that. 
our focus as people is not on what's happening across the water. So when we constantly get bombarded with these narratives of, oh, well, we need to send a few hundred million to this and a few hundred million to that. And then there's a chance that if this happens, we may have to put boots on the ground. We're sending the USS ship here. And it, it's just like, what's happening here? What is happening here? All y'all that got beef, like I've said a million times, let all the world leaders who got beef go in a room together with some box cutters and hammers and go at it, right? That winner take, well, I don't want to say winner take all because our leaders are a little old. I don't know if they'll make it out. <laughs> but um, man, like it, it's just wild here. And for those who are saying like, well, if Orange Man was in office, none of this would have been happening. It would have been the same response. Even with Israel and Gaza, there's a lot of folks because I'm very not even just disappointed because I already didn't have an expectation out of this, but I had been side-eyeing the U.S. in its response to everything with Gaza this entire time. We are on the wrong side of history. It's no questions asked, right? But um, the crazy part is, had Orange Man been in office, it would have been the exact same thing. And I think people forgot that, you know, Iran definitely attacked the U.S. base in 2020 when, because I know Orange Man was talking about this would have never happened if I was still president. I'm like, no. They actually attacked one of our bases, right? And we had those 34 troops that had all kind of injuries. And then Orange Man said, oh, they just got headaches. You know, give them some Tylenol, they'd be all right, <laughs> right? So, like, uh, it's a lot. I, mm, 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 mm. I'm going to pause. Let me read here. I just, man, I'm just tired of us being collateral to nonsense. Oh, I am tired of it. Anita Gardner said, our politics is draining because some of us are realizing that there are some dumb MFs or dumb A people voting and don't understand politics at all. I just think there's too much going on, man. We are in a really weird space. And I know some people like, I just don't vote no more. I'm like, okay. I just, like I said before, we're not even in a space where there's a guarantee that you'll even have a vote in the next few years. There's no guarantee that, I think we keep moving as if we can just keep undoing things. Some of this stuff we might be living through for the next 20, 30 years if we're not careful. So it's kind of like, I don't know. Um, man. Yeah, somebody said Netanyahu is trying to draw the Middle East into war, which, which is wild to me. Because, hey, listen, if all of them decide to gang up on Israel, Israel's done. He, there's no amount of intervention is going to help them because the U.S. is too far away. Europe is too far away. If all those countries around Israel say we're done with y'all and they all swarm in Israel, y'all on your own. And that Iron Dome ain't going to work forever, right? <laughs> that Iron Dome can only take so much. So y'all better be for real, right? Um, but I'm like, yeah, Israel, what are y'all doing, man? Netanyahu is crazy. Has always been. He had when Netanyahu got voted out, out of office in the 90s, and when he came back in, he had a vengeance. Understand, he's somebody that did a full 180 in his politics. Please go and look up this man and look at how he's moved politically. Like he's unhinged, right? Crazy. Yeah, I'm like, they, they just remind me. And they be moving, they be doing all this because they know the U.S. is going to back them. Let the Biden shake the table and tell them you we, cut, cut and, and see how they move. Watch how things shift around here. It reminds me, like, it, it's they just remind me of, like, the younger sibling that goes and bothers everybody at the playground. And then when everybody's ready to beat them up, they go and get the big brother. Like, it, every time. It, oh, it reminds me, I think I told the story before. <laughs> One time my brother came home crying. We're seven years apart. I was in high school. I think he was... Maybe sixth grade or something, right? Um, he came home crying. I was like, what's wrong? He's like, I just got beat up. I'm like, what? You know, I'm running. I'm putting my shoes on. First of all, I'm not even a fighter like that, but I was psyched up. You know, I'm putting my shoes on. Who is it? He told me the kid's name. I'm like, what? Well, what is he? What is he, black? Because, you know, you start asking what the race is. You start, that's to decipher what kind of fight it's going to be, right? got to figure out how, how much fighting you're going to be doing. I'm like, is he black? And my brother's like, no. I'm like, oh, is he white? Because, you know, I'm really tired. And my brother's like, no. I'm like, well, what is he? He's like, Samoan. Oh, well, <laughs> Whew, okay, you know, them Samoan kids are pretty big, and, you know, it'd be like eight of them in one family. So uh, I, we didn't go outside that day. I, I turned into uh, <laughs> with a spoon from Friday, you know. You know, you win some, you lose some, but you live. You live to fight another day. I was like, Marcus, you're going to have to take that L because I, I know that this is probably like a fifth or sixth grader, but a, a fifth grade Samoan is like, <laughs> it's built like a 22-year-old man. So I was like... I'm not even going out there. And um, yeah, there's too many of y'all. So we I, I, we just don't take the L. You got to learn to use your words and communicate effectively. 
And it's funny because my best friend growing up was Samoan. And like, man, when I tell you, it, his family was so huge. I felt like everybody was related. Like, man, he already had like six or seven siblings. But if all the cousins and stuff came to town, it'd be like 50 people. And they used, just used to be in packs. So everybody knew you don't mess with the Samoan kids. So I was like, I don't know what you did, but you're going to have to take that L on that one. Um, because I'm like, we ain't no point in both of us being beat up. So, so uh uh. All right, let's see some comments here. Yeah, hopefully everything um and all that eases. Netanyahu needs to get out of there. I need Israel to act like they got some sense, especially the people they keep voting that man back in. Crazy. Somebody said, oh, you have left. Where are you now? I think that's about working with the kids. Um, I, I don't work at the center anymore. I still volunteer there. Um, and I'm still really close with everybody, so I'm always still in the loop. But right now, I, I do a lot of work from home now. So I kind of work more so in, like, tech-related stuff now. Um, let's see. Somebody said, y'all ain't ready for Iran. Biden better proceed with caution. That's my thing. We keep acting like all these countries they ain't got gadgets and technology anymore. See, the U.S. always had the luxury of being at its place geographically because it's the U.S. is a very hard place to invade because, you know, there's no way to get here. You got to go either by air or by water. And by the time you get out there, our intelligence has picked it up and it's on and popping. But at that same token, everybody's weapons have developed and everybody has all this great technology and stuff. So if they want to start shooting missiles and bombs and everything else like that, it's not a challenge to get over here with that kind of stuff anymore. That's why I'm like, we need to chill. And we do have bases and 800 bases all around the world, right? So most likely, if they really wanted to shake the table, they're not even going after U.S. mainland. They're just going to go after the bases in Europe and in Asia and every place else because a lot of these bases, some of these bases only got like 500 people on them, right? They're going to just go to all those bases and tear all that stuff up, right? So it's just like we're in a slippery slope. I need everybody to just chill, right? Man. All right. Um, Tyler Hackner said, I did hear after a talk with Biden, he called off a strike. I hope so. Netanyahu need to sit down, quit bringing us into the nonsense. Like I said, let Netanyahu and whoever runs Iran, let them go in a room together and duke it out. Stop bringing us in it. Netanyahu should already be charged for war crimes with Gaza anyway. Somebody said, Jen Alpha is like 10. But you know what? They'd be on TikTok. They'd be knowing what's going on. Man. They are not buying it. Yeah, we we are just not in that era where they can just tell us anything and we run behind it anymore. It's just not a thing. Even older people are starting to catch on because they've lived long enough to see a pattern continue and continue. So even a lot of older people are like, we're over this crap, right? We just got too much going on over here to be worried about jumping into other things. I'm like, I, y'all lucky I'm not president. Uh, some of these countries would be mad with me because I'm like, listen, I'm sorry. I know we had a treaty back and whatever, but we, we gutting that. That's gutted. Everybody mind your business. We're going to go from there. That's all I got. All right. Um, somebody said, I don't blame the Israeli people. I blame the ultra-nationalism. If you treat your neighbors like something you can take because you have the ability, it never ends well. Yeah, it's just like it, it's a history of just bad relations in that whole region, right? Uh, and honestly, to be honest, people look at the U.S. the same way, right? I, I think for people who, I don't know, don't really like to challenge the status quo, can y'all just look at what we did with Argentina? That alone should be like, dang, U.S. for real? Can y'all look at what we did to Panama? Y'all would be like, dang, U.S. for real? Can y'all look at what we did in Nicaragua? <laughs> we ain't even got off the Western Hemisphere yet. I mean, we just go country by country by country. Y'all would be like, dang, right? Well, our hands are tied into so much nonsense over time. So it's like not a good look, right? And my biggest fear is that all of us will be collateral to stuff that was done 20 and 30 years ago by crooked, evil politicians, right? Okay. Um, I see beauty. What's up? Oh, she said she's laughing at something. Um, Yeah, I know. Like I said, some folks are saying they're just done voting. I, I this ain't the time. I just need people to understand. 
the vote is it's, it's literally you, you go and check and you go home. There's nothing else tied to it. It's not a marriage. It's not an endorsement of blind loyalty to anybody. I just think really, I need folks to just look at policy and really think about the long term, right? Your vote lives even after you pass on, to be honest, right? So a lot of the nonsense we're living through right now is the result of things that happened in the 80s, right? A lot of Reagan policy we're still paying off of, right? You know, I think one of the biggest challenges we've had with infrastructure is, again, changing the tax code when Reagan got in office and making the super wealthy no longer pay 70% in taxes and drop it down to 28%, right? That played a huge role into why there was such a major, major deficit that started coming and why our schools started falling apart and why the roads have been, I mean, well, we now have Build Back Better to kind of combat some of that, but, you know, like all of that plays a role. And then understand that by cutting their tax rate down to 28 and then raising taxes on the working and middle class, now it's like we're being burdened to carry the brunt of something that at one point we weren't responsible for because we didn't make enough. The super wealthy kind of handled that. And the luxury was they still got to be wealthy, right? And then, you know, we talked about the 2018 tax codes changes, and I'm sure a lot of you guys were pissed off with your taxes this year, especially at the federal level, because a lot of y'all ended up owing. <laughs> but um, yeah, everything plays a role. Look at what's happening with Arizona. I'm like, they literally, no matter where you stand with women's reproductive rights, I'm like, the, the fact that they took a law from 1864 before Arizona was even a state and made it the law of the land right? We have draconian people in office right now. Like, understand it. Once Obama got in there, everybody was kind of in like, ooh, sigh of relief mode. We can just kick, chill and kick it. But white rage had kicked in and they had been plotting. 2010 midterms come in. We get all these Tea Party candidates, right? And I feel like it's been an S-word show ever since. You have all these people who are running for office. Even people from January 6th. I forgot how many people that were charged in January 6th are currently running for office. You got a lot of people who are working to submit different things, right? And I just think there's no way you can comfortably just sit here and think you're going to be all right by like, I don't know. I don't know what the goal is. For people who do what they do, you know, much love to you. But I'm just like, not I. I ain't no damn way. All right. As someone who, especially when I was still working in the nonprofit world, I, had, I really had to be politically involved because nonprofits are some of the first things that are collateral under certain administrations. Like, you, man. All right. Okay, we gotta keep going, y'all. I got so many other things to still cover. Which page is that? Um, let's see. Let me go to my phone here. Man, so much going on. Oh, I did want to talk about this North Carolina bookstore. Um, let me go to that really quick. I'm gonna read the article and then we are going to talk because this kind of goes back to that same conversation of why the goalpost always moves. Right. Um, because people will love to kind of push this narrative of people don't work hard enough or people ask for handouts or blah, 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 all these different things. And it seems like you keep getting evidence of every time people try to build or create something and you know who comes to tear it all down. So North Carolina's first black woman owned children's bookstore is being forced to close due to threats. This is coming from Essence. Less than a year after opening, Liberation Station Bookstore is closing its doors. There is an estimated 149 Black-owned bookstores in the U.S., which is just 6% of the 2,500 independently-owned bookstores in the country. One of them was opened by a Black woman in North Carolina. Less than a year later, she says she has to close her doors because of threats. Liberation Station Bookstore, the first Black-owned children's bookstore in North Carolina, is closing its location rally, rally um, and plans to reopen in a new city after receiving threats. Liberation owner Victoria Scott Miller took to Facebook to share her account of what led her to the decision to relocate, numerous threats since September. Some threats we brushed off, while others included disturbing phone calls detailing what our son Langston wore when he was at a shop alone, Scott Miller said. In response, we've been strategizing with our means to avoid being targeted. This has involved frequently changing our operation hours, generating content after hours, and taking turns between my husband and me to oversee the store. Despite the challenges, our bookstore has brought immense joy and we've been determined not to become another headline of controversy. We've worked tirelessly to create a safe space, not just for our community, but for our own family as well, she continued in the post. Despite her recounting, the Raleigh Police Department shared that they hadn't been contacted about any threats or harassment, but acknowledged there's been social media posts related to Liberation Station. The bookstore has been keeping its audience abreast of the next steps. 
Over the next few weeks, we'll remain operational until Saturday. Oh, that was yesterday, April 13th. And afterwards, we will begin our move forward. Any remaining inventory will be donated to literacy nonprofits throughout the triangle. Collectively, we will go back to drawing to the drawing board to reassess and redefine what we will need in our next location, Scott Miller said in a post. We want to thank everyone for the calls and messages of encouragement. The point that I want to get at with that, remember how I, I just said we're already in this really weird space where everything is draconian, right? So one thing that we've been kind of talking about since 2018, right, is one, people working to cement things and, and lock things in. That idea of white nationalism, that idea of anti-blackness, that idea of white supremacy being locked in, in in little tiny increments. One from a political level where you had an influx of people run for really small local positions. And then with a lot of those local positions, they were in a capacity where they could change and restructure whether those positions were elected or appointed. So we saw a lot of positions that were once electable become appointed by people who were elected, and then some of them have kind of locked in where, you know, there's not even anybody coming in after them. What's the town I just saw where they haven't had an election in like a few years? Um, um, let me see. Here we go, and this, this is just from uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Alabama town that hasn't he held elections in decades sued to allow voting. The town of New Bern saw white officials deny its first black mayor, Patrick Braxton, we, we talked about that, from exercising his duties for three years. The town of New Bern, Alabama has not had a political election in the last several decades, but that could all change this November if a new motion is successful. Going back to what I was saying, where again, that idea of cementing certain things. Folks are getting into some of these positions, some of these roles, closing the door behind them and throwing away the key and making sure that there's no way to unlock it because they took the padlock off the door too, right? And so they're locking in all these different things. So that's one way they're doing it politically. The other thing is to, by going tit for tat in every aspect, as far as you're seeing a reversal of things, you're seeing the anti-DEI wave, right? Where you're watching all these people who are directors of diversity inclusion at these corporations and magazines and businesses be fired, right? Whole departments closing down overnight. You know, all of these different attacks. We've seen affirmative action, get reversed, right? We see the lawsuit with the fearless fund. We've seen all of the Ever Bloom lawsuits. We've seen, you know, what's happening with regard to voting rights and the fact that, again, other sections of the voting rights bill are now on the docket. I think it's section 2.3 is on right now. Like I said before, if Clarence Thomas has his way, section five will be the part that he goes after. Like there's all these different things that are taking place. And another aspect is also just violence, right? Violence is one of the main aspects that's been happening in regard to people working to cement things, people that are fighting to maintain the status quo and they're willing to do it to the death, right? And so that's why you get people who go and storm a Capitol on January 6th, right? You know, this is why we keep seeing mass shootings that are kind of centered in white rage. So we saw the Buffalo supermarket shooting. You know, you literally drive and, and not only do you go after people who are minding their business and just trying to shop at the, the one grocery store in the area, you know, that most of the black people shop at, you go and you just, you take unsuspecting folks who are minding their business all because of the rage that you have with, with stuff that really has nothing to do with anything. It's all kind of sitting in your head because y'all have bought into this great replacement theory nonsense, right? So there's that. You have people who go and they'll go shoot up a church, the Charleston Nine, right? You, after they literally had Bible study and fellowship with this man and probably would have gave him a fish plate downstairs after service, but he decided to spray everybody, right? So there's the violence. So now you see this with the store, right? Where a lot of times when black people do create something or build something and it's celebrated, who's the first always in line ready to take it back down and gut it? And that's the pattern that we've seen when you even talk about what happened when you talked about a lot of the race massacres back in the day, whether that be Rosewood, whether that be a Coe, Florida, whether that be Tulsa, whether that be some of the, what we saw in Louisiana, what we saw in East St. Louis, what we saw in all these different places, right? Where again, every time black people build something, the rage and animosity, because there are white Americans who feel that nobody's supposed to have more than them. Nobody's supposed to even have equal to what they have. People are supposed to be beneath them. So when they see people who have any element of an opportunity to rise. And if there's something for something to have an opportunity to grow or get bigger or gain traction, they always fight to shut it down, which is why now you're watching all the, the kind of like scholarships centered around race be taken to the courts. People think that's racist now, right? You're just seeing people do any and everything to maintain a status quo, right? And so this bookstore is a prime example of that, right? The idea that there's a black owned bookstore and the fear that really exists is white folks are afraid of what's inside the bookstore. They saw the word liberation and said, oh, my God, they're having Black Panther meetings in there. <laughs> we got to do something. They're meeting. They're organizing. 
right? There's so many things that take place. Like, understand, one of the reasons why a lot of black churches were often targeted in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was because the black church at one point was the meeting spot to organize a lot of times when it came to things happening with civil rights, which is why so many churches were burned and firebombed and everything else or shot up, which is crazy because these are the same people that claim to be Christians. These are the same people that, that are just so evangelical and so holier than thou and love the Lord and they move with conviction and that, that's why you got all the Roby Wade stuff going on and all this and all that. But then look how they move, centered in hatred, centered in rage, centered in violence. It's almost like violence is okay as long as it's white, right? That's, that's when it's okay, right? Absolutely crazy. So again, the idea, and, and we often see people say, well, you know, black businesses, the black people don't ever get, get too much. They sit and whine and ask for handouts. And here we have this business. And not only that, a, a great bit, a bookstore, right? It wasn't even a liquor store, like, because, you know, we will we, we'll open up a liquor store, but right. Um, but, you know, like a great business, something that has cultural significance to the area, right? Books are amazing, right? Reading is amazing. I wish people did more of it, to be honest, right? Something, and again, the thing that makes it interesting is this is a store that's open to anyone. Anyone can go there to learn. But the other challenge is that when there is a status quo, the luxury that white Americans get in this country is they get the luxury to stay stupid collectively, right? They can stay as stupid as they want to no consequence because the system backs them and allows them to do that. That's why a lot of these people who are so, you know, I'm not even talking about people that just specifically vote for Trump, but people that literally worship the man and the man can do no wrong. And no matter what Trump does that's out of pocket, they're going to find a way to justify it. That demographic, they recognize that there's no burden that they have to abide by because there is enough of them because they still are the majority population and they live under a system that benefits them and allows them to do whatever it is that they want, that they get the luxury to stay stupid collectively forever. And they'll always win in, in their eyes, right? Everybody else, we constantly have to fight, learn, grow, and continue to evolve with the world in order to stay within the game in order to stay in the competition. And I've always said, like, the minute you choose to stop learning is when you stunted your growth because the world is always going to continue to change, right? And the worst thing you can do, I, I feel like you should not be in a space where intellectually you're in the same place you were this time last year. There should be some element of growth that you've attained. Like, even with this channel, right? I don't think I've always had it right on everything that I say, but I definitely feel like there has been some intellectual growth over the last decade on this channel. You know, I think some of my viewpoints and opinions have evolved or shifted. There's some things that I felt a certain way on years ago that I feel the total opposite on now and vice versa. But you constantly grow and evolve over time. But America has allowed a space where whiteness and the love of whiteness and the fear of blackness has allowed folks to almost disintegrate and move backwards. So now you're seeing librarians being charged. You know, you're watching book bans. You know, what's so crazy is when you study apartheid in South Africa, one of the main things that they used to drag South Africa for was they had book bans. You you know, in South Africa back in the 80s and in the 70s, there were books that the people weren't allowed to read. There were movies that they couldn't watch. There were art, even with the different music that came out, you know, that music that was popular over there. They, the labels had to change the cover of the album to make sure that it didn't show black folks on there and everything else like that. And these lectures and stuff that was in our books would just make South Africa look like the craziest place. Like, can you believe they're attacking the freedoms of these people? people by banning books. Who challenges and stops people from learning? And then here we are in 2024, book bans, right? You know, we get, we have schools that are literally getting rid of librarians and saying, let's put chaplains in there because, again, everybody's so Christian. Like, okay, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of nonsense going on, right? And so, again, it, it's just crazy. And you're, this will not be the only one, right? You're going to keep seeing it, right? Even look at what's happened with social media. Look at Twitter, right? I purposely am convinced that Elon Musk bought Twitter because he wants to control a specific narrative about American politics, right? Now, he runs on this whole thing, oh, it's about freedom of speech. But notice that, you know, a lot of journalists have been banned from Twitter, right? If you look at the ads that pop up, most of the ads are right-wing propaganda or something in regard to something that's going to put some crazy politician in, right? Like, everything is very compromised right now, right? And it's very interesting watching somebody like Elon Musk, who is also an immigrant, you know, Spew into some of these narratives that are out there, right? You know, because I, I just saw the whole thing too, where, you know, um, Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, just did this whole thing where they're like, oh, we're going to go and, you know, we're going to make it so you have to prove that you're a citizen in order to vote and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I wish people would understand when it comes to voting, people who are not documented, honestly, none of these politicians are that great that they're going to throw their livelihood away and try to vote. Like when you're looking at the numbers, there aren't 
people who are undocumented voting in federal elections because it's illegal. And most people who are undocumented don't want their names on anything, which is why many of them don't do bank accounts, which is why many of them work jobs where they're paid under the table or paid through different methods that don't have to have a lot of their information out there. But again, America has chosen to play stupid and say, oh no, you know, there were 3 million illegal votes in the 2016 election. That's why Hillary still had more votes than, than Trump. But those were illegal votes. And, you know, then we get to 2020. Yeah, a lot of the illegal immigrants were, they, we were bringing them in from different countries just to come and vote. I said, you think people are leaving their home country to come here and vote for some people that are already still putting in policy that's screwing their country over? Make it make sense. So we're just in this place where now people who are in power get the luxury to also be stupid, right? And the stupid collective runs behind it because it's power and number. And so we're just sitting here watching it. And I'm just like, is everybody for real right now? Is everybody for real? I, Lord, make it make sense. I'm going to stop right there. Hopefully that bookstore, they're able to thrive somewhere else. But it, it's sad that you can't even open a business without being threatened because anti-blackness is that strong. The fear of black success is that scary for some folks because they haven't evolved enough. And they're afraid that black people are going to bypass them with everything. So they said, we we're just going to shut it down. A whole bookstore. The bookstore is open to anybody. You can go in there and read whatever you want. But they choose not to. They don't have an interest in what we have because they think everything that we do. You know, the thing that I've also learned with these conversations of race, one of the biggest fears that people have about black folks is everybody's afraid that we're going to do to them what they've done to us. And I'm like, see, that's the issue. See, y'all read through the lens of how you see the world. That's you all that are inherently violent collectively. Right. Everybody else is just trying to mind their business and go along their merry way. And so, you know, we have to be collateral to white fear. And I'm like, not I said the cat, man. By the way, I know there's a lot of new people who showed up after the Candace Owens video. Just so y'all know, I don't like, I was going to say a different phrase, but I kind of say it with my chest on here. So for folks who think I'm a little too direct, this is how it's always going to be. I don't sugarcoat around race because they don't sugarcoat around anti-blackness. So we say it like it is around here. All right. Let's see. I wish I would open a store and somebody threatened it. Ooh, man. You know, I get threats on YouTube every now and then. I'm like, whatever. But, uh, okay, let's see here. Um, where are we at here? Darian said, I'll be glad when this election cycle is over, too. We're getting screwed either way. Like, it, yeah, I am. Uh, and it's like, and as soon as the election ends, like, it's like November comes and they already got political ads for all the, I'm like, dang, man, it just never stops, right? I remember when 2020 was finally over, I was like, oh, we can breathe for four years. And I feel like I, I haven't had a chance to breathe yet. <laughs> like, it's just crazy, right? All right. Um... A golf Twitter said land grabs just make war and terrorism. That's really what um, Netanyahu's doing with Gaza. The idea is to get rid of all of that and turn that into real estate and everything else. That's exactly what they're doing, right? The, even with them going to invade Rafa, I was like, that makes no sense to me. Because at this point, like, understand, Gaza is about twice the size of D.C., right? And the whole northern half is already gone. They bomb, bombed and destroyed all of that. They made all the people evacuate to the southern portion. And mind you, this is one of the most densely populated segments of the world, right? You're literally there shoulder to shoulder. And so anyway, you made all these people evacuate and go to the southern portion of Gaza. They tried to build little tents and everything. There's almost a fear of famine because there's not enough food getting there. Israel will not allow the roads to open for people to deliver food. So they have to do it by boat or drop it by air and everything else like that. And then they're like, oh, well, we still need to invade Rafah. And it's like, well, why are you invading them? And they're like, oh, it's because, you know, Hamas is still in there. And it's and it's and they're still using the narrative of, oh, the, the human shields are there. And this. So I'm like, so y'all going to bomb the people? There's some people using human shields. So you're just going to blow up everybody. Right? Okay, make that make sense. Y'all out here just saying anything. Again, that idea of using the big bad boogeyman theory to get people to run behind you and justify the nonsense. Just stupid. Ah, oh. man. Oh, that sounds good. Um, El Coop uh, said, Calvin, you almost made me choke on my res con pollo with that one. Man, there's a, um, or arrows con pollo. There's a spot in down Route 1. When you go past Alexandria, Virginia, they have, a, oh, they make a good one of those. Like, I always go there when I get, like, some Peruvian chicken and the rice. But, man, I haven't been there in, like, a year. I might have to go there this week. Oh, they had an arrows. Oh, that crap is so good. Thanks for the suggestion. I'm about to try that. I, you know, I might have to make a trip to Virginia this week. All right, anyway.
<laughs> Alan said, Calvin, you're going to get knocked out Friday style, but you'll live to fight another day. See, the good thing is I've never had to do too much fighting because I was always good with words. I always made everybody laugh. So nobody ever was like trying to fight me. They're like, nobody's going to bother him. He's the funny guy. Leave him alone. Like I was always good. Even like in my neighborhoods that I've lived in, sometimes I lived in a neighborhood that was a bit rougher than the other. I always made friends with everybody on the corner. Like even where I live now, I know every person that might have a substance abuse problem on the corner. I speak to everyone. That way, when something go down, I got some backup, right? There's this nice lady that, that sits in like a wheelchair on the corner. I always speak to her every time. I even got her a Christmas card when I walk past, you know, during the holiday season. Like, I, I be smart. I strategize. Like, I get to know all my neighbors, right? I'm cordial. Like, you cordial to me, I'm cordial to you. So, you know, I've never really had too many problems in, in the city. Everybody kind of, you're kind of known on your block, fortunately, right? I get along with everybody. I make everybody laugh. People come to me, they want something to laugh at. You get that friend that calls, they had a bad day. Can you tell me something funny? I need to laugh. Okay. What you want to talk about? All right. Thank you, Tyler. Exactly. Voting is not a personal expression of one's beliefs, right? Because no, there's no candidate that has everything that you want. However, it's about harm reduction for me. Even um, if both cause harm, it's about who would cause the least harm for me. And that, it's a that's a crappy way to look at our politics, but that's really where we're at right now. Right now, it's a space of harm reduction. That's how I feel like we've been moving for like the last 20 years, right? And I think there's people who more so want that dream politician that's going to give you everything. But I'm like, we're, we're so far from that right now because there's too much other nonsense going on. And now you got white people going at it with each other, right? That's how down bad we are right now, right? So, yeah, I'm, I don't look at any of this as a marriage. This is not a loyalty or pledge or blind allegiance to anybody. It's just like certain stuff is on the docket. Certain stuff is, is at the poll. I'm about to be there because there's certain things I'm not about to just take a nap on and stuff gets worse, right? Absolutely not. Man, but, and you know what pisses me off too? Please go back to my lives from 2018 when I was saying that was the time to start really pushing candidates for like this time period. Now that's my other beef. It's like people got so much, but then it's like, I don't ever see nobody pushing these candidates that we could get behind. It's And so it's like, uh, and it doesn't help. Then you got the RNC and the DNC. They're already gonna buy everything out anyway. So then the candidates you do like kind of get bought out or bought off or overspent and, and drowned out. and then. Stupid things like, you know, you're not eligible to be in the debate if you don't have this percentage of poll. Like, it's just it's just set up to keep the nonsense. I hate it so much. Anyway. I'm like, even if you skip the presidential election, at least focus to the, um, what should we call it, local stuff. Somebody said, now, Calvin, rally, rally. I It's rally, right? Like, rally, like, not ra rally, rally. Ah, Y'all know what I'm talking about. Let me, we're going to figure out how to say this city. North Carolina, y'all, y'all got me sounding illiterate. Let's see. I'm about to, I'm about to um charge it to my accent. That's just my accent, y'all. Let's see. Let's see how Google says it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did they say? Oh, okay, I'll ask that later. All right. Let's see Google. United States, we're going to be looking at how... Ah, 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 I just said say the word. Now you got a whole introduction. Just say the word. Raleigh. Raleigh? Raleigh. Raleigh. That ain't how I've been saying it. Okay. <laughs> Stubborn, hard-headed. <laughs> Don't listen. Uh, Thank you, Little Eye 3D. Um, Let's see. Um, Where we at here? Y'all be keeping this chat live, y'all. Um... I said, would you open borders if you were the president? No, there's no reason to open the borders. I think they need better, like a better process. The issue with our border at the South is it's never, <laughs> it's never been secured from day one, right? It's always just been whatever it is, right? And there's just never been, I feel like our politicians purposely kick the can down the road around the conversation on the border because it will always be a talking point. And either side can win the argument when the other side is in power about the border. It can always be that thing, right? And so it's just always been what it is. And, and we literally, we're at a space where there was an opportunity for legislation to get passed, right? And they had the votes 
what happened? Orange man told everybody on the GOP side, don't do it. We don't want Biden to get any wins. And so they all reneged and changed their minds. And then here we are again. And now they're getting blamed for the border. I'm like, this is, politicians are so, ah, everybody's just so stupid. God, man. Um, Adner Norma said, remember Project 2025, the GOP gets in. Which and they are not hiding that crap. They are standing tall and proud with that. I'm like, y'all better be for real. That's why I'm like, y'all sitting out. Like, it, it's not always going to be a we we all right. We're comfortable. I think a lot of us move the way we move because even when things are terrible, we still have some element of comfort. We're not down bad. We're down bad, but we're functioning. Wait till it gets to that place where folks aren't functioning anymore, right? We all be in the bread line. We gonna learn then. All right. And then the bread line probably, uh, they're going to be rationing the bread line by race, <laughs> right? Black folks, our stuff going to be moldy. I have to find new recipes to get by. All right. Um, let's see. Yes, I don't care for Elon. He is an idiot. If there's somebody I want to fight for real, now that's somebody I would square up with, no questions asked, like on site. It's not even a thought. There's so much. That man there is just, oh, man. Scalesti said these past four years went by so fast. I feel like... um. Once we got into the pandemic, I feel like time just jetted. I feel like it was 2019, like 18 months ago. And I'm like, we're about to, well, we're in 2024 now. And 2024 is almost at the halfway mark in two months. I'm like, it's crazy. Man. What up, um, Regina Harding? This is the first time I've caught you live. Love the conversation. Appreciate it. All right. Um, yeah, I say if anything, really focus on the local election. At least that. Uh, Pisces Pis Beauty said, you know, we'd be the last on the food list. Got to get our mutual aid muscles working. That's why That's why even when it comes to a lot of what you call the grifters, right? You know, like our Candace Owens and all them. My thing that is just entertaining with that, and this is a really silly scenario, but I used to say this back in the day, right? You know, for the ones who start running behind white nationalists and everything and, and join in with all the anti-black talking points because it gives them a check or they think that somehow it's going to get them in the door. Just, I always say, listen, if there was some random apocalypse and the world was in it and we all had to get on ships to go to some new planet, understand when they start organizing those ships by race, you still getting on the black ship. You're going to have to get in line with us. It doesn't matter how much anti-blackness you spew. No white person is letting you get in line with them and you're not cutting nobody else. You are not getting on their ship. You are going to go to the black ship, right? And you know, they're going to set our ship up. The hydraulics going to be messed up. They would have forgot to put gas in ours. I won't even take off. We're going to be stuck here, <laughs> right? So I'm like, y'all keep running behind that nonsense if you want to. You're going to learn at some point, right? Man. All right, we got to move on. I got so many other things I still need to cover here. Okay, where are we at? Let's see. Um, I have not seen, I know they've been talking about there's like a Good Times reboot on Netflix. I wasn't really planning to see it. I think if they were smart, they would have just called it something else. I think calling it Good Times makes people think it's going to be reminiscent of the original show. And a lot of people did not like the trailer, found it offensive. And then with, again, a lot of the writers are white, which I'm like, well, that's technically what the original Good Times was like too, <laughs> right? Um, but I think they would have fared better if they just called it something else, right? Um, but I, the show didn't really appeal to me because it's, again, you're kind of, it's them hopping on something that's already kind of been done as far as the conversation, not in regard to the original Good Times, but just what they're talking about on there. I haven't seen it. Y'all can tell me how it was. But I, I think, um, I think there's more out there that Netflix could have invested in or got behind, right? I don't think this was needed. And then when I saw Seth MacFarlane on there, I'm like, oh, the family guy, dude. Great, he's telling one of our stories again. Oh, this reminds me of the Cleveland show. Okay, I guess. And you know, I just I don't know. I good luck, right? Um, let's see. Oh yeah. Um, let me see. 
Also, rest in peace to Rico Wade from uh, Organized Noise. If you don't know Organized Noise, just know that they are some of the they were some of the dopest producers out there, right? Um, let's pull up their um, production list. I I always appreciated what they were able to do for like TLC Waterfalls. Like that was really really dope. Um, as far as like if you, I don't know if I can find an acapella, but if you really kind of pay attention to what was done with the background vocals on Waterfalls is really, really cool because it's, you know, it's TLC on there, but there's also Deborah Keelings. You always say that's the fourth member of TLC. There's CeeLo Green is singing on the hook as well. It's just a very interesting uh, sound that they have. But some of the stuff that they've also done, you know, they did everything for Outkast, right? All of those classic Outkast albums, that is all of them. Um, let me see. I need them to give me like some of the songs. I don't want the albums. Um, oh, yeah. In Vogue's um, Don't Let Go. Really, really great one. And that one makes me mad because that's right around the time that they broke up. But something about Don't Let Go just has this really, really big sound. You know, with In Vogue, okay, the very first album, you can tell that they're in a, a smaller studio. It's still, you know, fun songs. The first album, that was Lies and You Don't Have to Worry and Don't Go. Not Don't Let Go, but Don't Go and Hold On. And then you get the Funky Divas. You can tell there's some money now. It's a different kind of studio. And so that, 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 Two songs of theirs before Don't Let Go that have that really big production to me would have been Never Gonna Get It and Free Your Mind. It's, you know, really bright, big in your face. But when that Don't Let Go comes in, just, just those piano chords alone, that doom, 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 it's just big in your face. You know something great is coming. And then that's one of the handful of songs where you have in Vogue singing out of their chest in their harmony. A lot of times they sing in head voice for most of their songs. So yeah, they will do Free Your Mind is out of their chest, but... You know, hold on is out of their chest, but it's not a lot of like sustaining notes. Kind of, and it's really just mainly just Cindy kind of singing and the other ones sing hooks. But like when you look at something like Give It Up, Turn It Loose, very pretty harmonies, right? But they're singing a lot of it out of head voice and falsetto. And it's a pretty blend. But Don't Let Go has them straight out of the chest voice, big belting, kind of might have had brownstone shaking a little bit like wait a minute oh wait i thought we were the belting what are they over there doing right and then all four of them got, got some ad libs in there you, you get terry she do her thing cindy does her thing max does her thing don her, does her thing great production um let me look at their other stuff let's see um and that's a really good documentary i think um we reviewed it on one of my in the news episodes some years ago um i don't know where to find that documentary but it was a really good documentary that just talks about the production process of what they did and especially when you're talking about the launch of Outcast, right? Um, so, you know, rest in peace to him. Let me see. Organize noise. I just want to see if there's any. Um, I just want the rest. Give it here. Give it here. Um, here we go. Let's see here. We also have. Oh, oh yeah. Goody Mob. I forgot about them. We're stepping up. Um, Blackberry Molasses for Mr. That's the group. Bobby Valentino used to be in back in the 90s. Um, UGK belts to match. So fresh, so clean. Oh, Ludacris, uh, Saturday. I remember in Spanish class, I did a Spanish version of that. Um, <laughs> for class, Les Sabado. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> like, I forgot how to win, but I remember that. Um, man. Yeah, they have some good some, some good ones here. So, yeah, definitely give them their kudos. All right, I'm going to read some comments, and we're going to keep it going. Dang, Calvin, every time you go on race, YouTube sends me to a commercial break. You got them bothered. I don't even see the thing popping up this time. Like normally on my screen, it's like right here. I'll see it says ad coming and I can hit skip and cancel the ad if I catch it. But I guess because I'm looking here, I'm never seeing it. Um, well, here's the thing. I don't do sponsorships. So most times y'all don't see me on here talking about, oh, today I'm wearing, you know, whatever. So I guess that that's the counterbalance, right? You, never, you don't get any sponsorship breaks where I got to talk about stuff, but they're still going to put their ads in and get their check too. All right. Um, man. Um, Sickle Fit says 17 Congress seats that are the most flippable. I'm sure they are heavily tar targeting those seats. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Like it's, this is a serious one to pay attention to. Like my, my, my hope would be that Congress is secured with some politicians that are not cuckoo. 
my fear is that some of these January 6th folks are going to get in the office and we're going to have more Marjorie Taylor Greens running around. I don't have the patience. I don't have the patience. Uh, Maggie V32 said, APAC is targeting black progressive Dems this election cycle. And what's interesting with APAC, and that's what I was saying, like, it's interesting to see how politicians are moving with the whole Iran-Israel thing, because again, all of these ones who've been bought out by APAC, they can't really say too much against Israel. They have to kind of make it, because you, you've seen some posts where it's like, you know, Iran has attacked Israel and we must, I'm like, mm, is that you talking or is that APAC? Like, interesting. This is why I don't like the idea of PACs and everything getting behind our candidates, because what happens is when candidates get bought out, they go into these deals and accept money from a lot of these interest groups, then they have to do what it is the interest group has paid them to do pretty much. You know, we donated $500,000 to your campaign and to whatever else you have in gifts. So yeah, you have to fight and lobby for what it is that we want, even if it goes against your values. And even if it goes against what it is that the people who voted you in, put you in for cinema. Look, as soon as she got in there, cinema was cashing them checks. And we saw her in the way. Same thing with Manchin. In the way, they was cashing them checks, living large, right? I said, I knew when cinema went and voted against the, the wages, I said, oh, she's going to be a problem. She's going to be a problem. Ran on the whole premise of we're going to change the system. I'm for the people. We The small voices will be heard. And as soon as she got in there, she'd been in the way this whole time. Man. Relax Library said, the couch ain't going to fix them potholes or expand Medicaid for your state. Right? Even with that. When you're talking healthcare and all these governors who purposely will not expand Medicare into their state because it ties with the Affordable Care Act and they still hate Obama. Like, we got stupid people in office right now. Just stupid. Don't make no sense. Um, somebody said, want cheaper groceries? Have the federal government link up with the farms to pay wages to refugees and migrants for labor while they wait on their cases. Win-win. Really, what needs to happen is a lot of these grocery chains are just hiking up the prices. It has nothing to do with the supply chain. It has nothing to do with demand and supply. It's them seeing that one store hikes up their prices and then the rest of them all do the same. Because a lot of these grocery stores have had record profits in the last two or three years, right? And prices are still going up. And you're seeing that with everything. We saw that with the airlines, right? Airlines got a huge bailout during the pandemic. And what did they go do? Give bonuses, right? Then lay off people, <laughs> right? Uh, just, uh, it's crazy, crazy time we're living in. Um, oh, y'all appreciate Funky Divas. Yeah, all right, in vogue. Oh, yeah, they're here too. Th them and TLC have a show together at Wolf Trap. Now, that one I might think about if the prices make sense, right? That, that That's probably a good ticket I can get for like 60 bucks, right? But yeah, it's algorithms, it, algorithm, algorithms and everything are starting to determine a lot of prices. I told you about the lawsuit. Actually, it's in the Whoopi video I did when she was talking about, you know, millennials don't have kids and houses because we don't work hard enough, that video. Uh, I talk about it in that video, but there's a whole class action lawsuit brought on by city of DC against several landlords who have been using algorithms to margin or create the margins of what the prices will be for rent in the city. And it affects over 60,000 residents here. And so I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of nonsense going on. All right. We got to keep going because I still got a few other things. Um, we've been talking about this TSU, right? We've been saying kind of pay attention to what was happening now. Remember, and I'm talking in Tennessee, right? So remember, let me get, I, I want to pull up an article because I'm going to actually actually read some stats here. Um, Tennessee State. Uh, and then the board got gutted. But remember, we talked about how there was a whole situation where, you know, it was discovered that Tennessee had been kind of, the state of Tennessee had been jipping certain schools with funding. And TSU specifically was owed about $2 billion in funding that they never received, TSU, HBCU, right? And so what has happened? Rather than the state giving what's rightfully owed, because hey, $2 billion for TSU could do so many great things for them. I remember when I went to this college fair and I went to um, the TSU table, they were so nice. I didn't end up applying there because I knew I wanted to go to either Howard or Morehouse, but you know, they were, so, everybody at the table was so nice, just the nicest people. I almost was thinking about it, but Remember, um, let me see. I'm going to just read the article. This is coming from the Tennessean. Republican lawmakers vacate full Tennessee State University board over Democratic objections. Um, Governor Bill Lee quickly signed, quickly signed the bill into law 
and must now make new appointments to the TSU board. Tennessee House Republicans on Thursday voted to vacate the entire Tennessee state board over the outcries of Democrats as the GOP supermajority um, reigned in on a pre previous deal struck in co committee to keep three of the board's 10 members. Governor Bill Lee signed legislation in the law by Thursday evening, an unusually fast move that comes as TSU actively interviews presidential candidates, candidates this week and appointed eight new members to the board. A faculty appointment and a non-voting student member will round out the board. Republicans argue a full leadership turnover is required after a scathing state audit last year and financial issues at TSU over the years. The House Democrats on Thursday suggested wiping the board clean is retribution after the board previously refused to oust going TSU President Glenda, Gover, uh, Glenda Glover. Um, a $2 million external forensic audit commissioned by legislators and released on Thursday found no instances of fraud or uh, malfeasance at a historically black university in Nashville, though it noted about 250% increase in scholarships at TSU between 2019 and 2023 was not sustainable. The scholarship and enrollment boom led to critical housing shortages on the campus. Uh, Democrats continually point to decades of historic underfunding of TSU, the only public HBCU in the state, arguing TSU has not been set up for success in the stark contrast to other public universities with historically white student bodies. Recent data from the Department of Education and the Department of Agriculture calculated that Tennessee underfunded TSU at a whopping $2.1 billion over the last 30 years, the largest amount of any state. Now, like I said, we already talked about this on live, but look at what's happening here. It's revealed that they're underfunded. They say, we want our money. And what does the state do? All right, let's just get rid of everybody who has the most to say. So they flushed the board. Now they're putting in their people. There's no telling what TSU is going to look like in a few years. And, and, and understand, like, in the same way that they have been gutting affirmative action, that they're getting rid of the DEI programs, that they're getting rid of everything and the CRT and the this and the that, HBCUs are next, right? Especially the publicly funded ones. Right. The next thing will be get them up out of there. Right. Think back to even before we got to all this, when you were at the very tail end of the last administration, when Orange Man was saying at this point, any federal institution that puts out any kind of discourse on things that go against our founding fathers, they will be defunded. Right. That was kind of one of the big pushes that was about to be a thing. It just never really came into fruition. But that's the next step. Right. So here we have TSU, where, again, we've been talking about them for about a year and a half. Some of you guys on here go there. I think. Was that Tyler, I think, that goes there? I can't remember. But, you know, talking about how, yeah, these are the things that have been happening at our school. And so, here, yeah, here's a school that's been underfunded, right? They're trying to do the best that they can with scholarships and trying to support. Because one of the biggest challenges for people who want to go to HBCUs is a lot of times HBCUs don't often, always have the best financial packages because the money's just not there. But, like, here we are. Flush the board. Change the leadership. And then we'll, eventually the state state takes over. Like, that's how that works. So keep an eye open with that. Like, when I say people are cementing things, this is what we'd be talking about. All right, let me see. Um, <laughs> Jay Gill said, that's the correct way to say it. That was me playing the playback. All right, fine. If that's what Google said, that's what they said. Fine. <clears throat> Whatever. <laughs> um, I know I'd be saying all kinds of names and stuff wrong all the time. Um, let me see where we at, where we at. Um, Bernadette Stannis and Eric Monty responded perfectly to that re Who's FaceTime me? You know I'm on live. <laughs> um, responded perfectly to I lost my spot. Oh, to that reboot. I haven't seen it yet, but you know, um Bernadette still looks really, really good. You know, that was Thelma from Good Times. I always thought she looked just like um what's that housewife from Atlanta? They look just alike to me. Um, they look just alike. Um, somebody said only men can sing in falsetto because of our Adam's apple. Women have a larger range with no separation between voices. No, women sing in a falsetto. They do. So if you think of like the end of <clears throat> like when Whitney Houston sings Run to You, 
you know, I want to run to you. Ooh, that part there is in like her falsetto voice. Or like a Janet doesn't sing out of her chest. So like on the songs where she still has a really big voice, it's all head, like it's a mix of falsetto in her, in her head voice. So like the All For You song is not out of her chest. It's still like her head voice with the falsetto mix. Um, or like, what was another example? Um, yeah, I mean, men, we tend to sing in it more because we, we're not sopranos and a lot of us aren't altos. Um, but yeah, you definitely have a falsetto. Women have falsettos. Um, let's see. Organized Noise first production was TLC's What About Your Friends, extended remix featuring Outkast, which Outkast, um, it was their first exposure to the public. I gotta go back and listen to that version. I don't know if I remember that one. Nerd Lars says $60 for a ticket in the DMV. Well, yeah, for Wolf Trap, yeah, you get a seat in the back, it'd be about 60 bucks. Man. Wait, somebody said not the G word. What's the, what, what did I say? What's the G word? God? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what I said. <laughs> um, did I miss the TSU? Oh, Billy Flood is the TSU person, not Tyler. Yes, Billy, we just talked about TSU. Um, yeah. Man. Um... Somebody said Leah did a lot of falsetto on Rock the Boat. Yeah, and I think one of the things with Leah too, because folks used to be like, oh, she couldn't sing live. I was like, no, really what it was, a lot of her songs were recorded in head voice and falsetto, but then when she would sing it live, she would sing it out of her chest, because falsetto sometimes doesn't carry as well live if it's not a rich one, right? So a lot of people will kind of transition from falsetto into head voice, because they're kind of in that same range. Um, head voice, just that head voice falsetto just it has a heavier bottom. Falsetto more so tends to be like, like, Robin Thicke, Lost Without You is all falsetto, but there's not a lot of heaviness with it. Where if you use like Prince Kiss, it's his falsetto, but it's his head voice. There's a bottom to it. So it has a heavier like texture to it versus airy, right? All right, um, where are we at here? I got a few more things. I didn't even think about talking about Drake. I forgot about that, but um, okay. I, get, I had to hit my friend up and ask, like, okay, give me the scoop on all the Drake, Kendrick, Metro Boomin, Future. Who else? Like, Rick Raw, all of them. Give me the scoop. It was too much. I was like, I'll come back to it later. Let somebody else cover that one. But I was like, they started talking about Drake and plastic surgery. I was like, dang, all right, Drake over there going under the knife. You know, I don't think I'd ever get plastic surgery. There's nothing I'd want to change unless you could make me taller and everything still match up, right? You know, I, I could use a, about five more inches of height. I'll take it. But I need everything else to, to match. You just can't be legs. That means my arms got to be even longer than they already are. <laughs> so I'm going to be looking like a cartoon character. So I don't know. Um, where else? Let's go to Dexter Reed. All right. Let me pull up that article. That's the last heavy one. And then the rest is all light. Um, of course, this is some foolery here. And it's interesting because this story you're not seeing in the media as much. And I said this, what, two lives ago, where I said a lot of times when you start seeing these situations where somebody is killed by the police unarmed, or, well, this in this specific situation, Dexter Reed did have a, a weapon in a vehicle, but we'll get to that in a second, um, that you weren't going to see a lot of these stories in the media as much because they don't want a repeat of the spring slash summer of 2020 ever again. So you've noticed that many of these stories, you're not seeing as much. Think back to like that period between 2013 to about 2017, when you saw the Terrence Crutchers and the Philando Castiles and the Eric Garners and you it, and Mike Brown, it was like story after story and Sandra Bland, like story after story after story after story and story. And it was just always in the cycle, right? And after a while, by the time you got the, to George Floyd and all the uprisings, it was like, all right, we're cutting, the, all right, cut how much these stories make the media because it's making the people too reactionary. So it's been very noticeable that a lot of these stories we're not hearing as much of, right? Okay, Chicago police superintendent says, says officers in Dexter Reed shooting won't be stripped of police powers for now. Um, days after the release of dozens of videos related to the police shooting death of Dexter Reed during a traffic stop last month, Chicago police superintendent Larry Snelling was asked Friday about the shooting. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, is investigating the shooting in the 
Humboldt Park neighborhood. The agency believes, based on preliminary evidence, that Reed fires at, fired at officers first, but there are still many unknowns about the conduct of the officers involved. An officer was also wounded during the shooting. Investigators were still looking into why Chicago police stopped Reed in the first place and why tactical, I'm sorry, and why a tactical team conducted the traffic stop for a seatbelt violation. A police officer was shot. A man lost his life, Snelling said during a Friday press conference on, or on Friday. In his first appearance since the public saw and heard the five Chicago police officers fire 96 shots in 41 seconds, striking and killing Reed, 26, during the traffic stop, Snelling said, at least for now, the officers will keep their police powers. I will not make a decision to strip officers until that investigation unfolds, Snelling said. Snelling said he refuses to pass judgment on videos released this week, insisting neither he nor anyone can come to a conclusion on the case until all the facts have been gathered. The superintendent appeared to be at odds with COPA, the agency investigating the killing. COPA had recommended the officers be relieved of their police powers while investigation continues, in part because the same tactical group was being looked at for another traffic stop a few weeks ago. Snelling said Friday that COPA had yet to interview the officers. We should let the proper investigation play out, and it should be fair across the board, he said. Nothing and no one should be judged in a court of public opinion. So my concern is that integrity of the investigation isn't jeopardized, and all of the evidence is collected and looked at. Past complaints against, op against officers involved in the Reed shooting. CBS2 dug into the complaints filed against five special operations officers. Among them, they have had 14 complaints in just the last year, including several complaints during traffic stops. On March 6th, just two weeks before Reed was stopped, someone alleged four of the officers stopped him without justification. In that case, the complaint the complainant acknowledged his vehicle had tinted windows at the time of the stop and also said the officer searched his car without justification. He was not arrested nor given any tickets. The complaint documents said the case remains under investigation. Back on March 1st, another citizen said one of the five officers showed unprofessional police conduct, also alleging an improper traffic stop and improper searches. The complaint is still under review. Some of the complaints to the COPA date back a few years. In September 2022, a driver was pulled over for what was said to be a traffic stop for a front-tinted windshield. The front seat occupants were ordered out and protested at first. The September 22nd complaint continues. The officers forcibly opened the passenger door and pulled him out and cuffed him. And then the officers conducted a brief search of the interior and turned off the body-worn cameras early. COPA found there was insufficient evidence of misconduct in that case. Um, I'm going to stop there because uh, actually there's only a little bit left. Let's keep going. Um, meanwhile, one of the officers uh, just lost my spot. Sorry. Uh, where were we at? All right. Meanwhile, one of the officers involved in the traffic stop is just 23 years old. Snelling was asked how that person made it to the specialized tactical team. This is something that we're looking into and something happens. Um, we make assessments. And this is part of my training background. Snelling said, Snelling said, I look at a game time film. Where can we improve? He added, Chicago has a very, very, very young police department. The superintendent added that the Chicago police department recently started to use dashboard or use a dashboard that they plan to use regularly to monitor personnel with multiple complaints. It will give us alerts if we see officers who have multiple complaints. And then at this point, we'll take action based on what we see. Snelling said he added that the action could mean training, taking the officer off the street for a while and then assessing the officer to see if they need to help help to deal with mental health concerns like post-traumatic stress disorder. CBS2 is looking into whether that dashboard will be made public and the role, if any, COPA has in putting it together. But then again, the superintendent emphasized that he stands by leaving the officers on paid leave and he insisted all facts are not yet available. He said he will review the case once the probe is completed, not rushing to judgment. Okay. Anyway, um, I should just be one of those people that do the commercials like where you have the product and then they got to give the disclaimers and read it really fast. <laughs> but anyway, um, the situation with that, what I find really interesting is, you know, they claim that he was pulled over because of a seatbelt violation. But if you've seen the video, all the windows are tinted. So I was like, how did you even how would you have been able to see anything with the seatbelts, first of all? But the bigger question becomes, why is it that they showed up because they weren't in like te technically the right uniform and barely kind of announced who they were? And so, you know, they pull up and they start yanking on this man's door. And of course, what happens? There's gunshots because he doesn't know who's coming to the door. And now this man has been shot 96 times. Cleo style circus set it off. And so, again, you're still seeing that same pattern. And this is why when we were in 2020 and there were all the uprisings and many people, myself included, kept saying, do not let these uprisings have you thinking that the work is done. Do not think that because some of these corporations have promised to do things that everything's going to get better and do not fall for the symbolism because this is when Nancy and crew, they were taking the knees with the kente cloth and, you know, officers would take a knee at some of the protests and then people bring out the grills and then here comes the electric slide and the Cupid shuffle and everybody's partying. And so we fast forward and really nothing has changed. When you think about it, the numbers are still about the same with regard to unarmed police shootings. 
and, and, and police shootings in general. Like I said, I think we're too comfortable with the idea of the police just being able to kill folks, you know, being the idea of, you know, jury and executioner all in, in, in a few seconds to me still doesn't sit right. And, you know, not a lot has technically changed. And we saw how people try to push the narrative and say, oh, well, the police have been defunded and this is why they can't do their jobs effectively. But I think on the last slide, we pulled the numbers that showcase that no, actually a lot of these departments ended up getting more funding. And the issue is more so again, that you're challenging a system that is still in operation, that hasn't really gone through any shifts. And that's why we're still seeing what we're seeing. How do we go from a traffic stop to gunshots? And not just gunshots, but 96 shots. You know, I'm sure after the first 20, the job was done. I'm sure after the first 30, the job was done. I'm sure after 40 shots, the job was done. And this is not a job I endorse or support, but still, 50 shots, 60, 70, 80, 90. Y'all still shooting? Like, for real? And again, we just saw, what's the case? There's another case in Chicago that this almost mirrors. Uh, is that Laquan McDonald? I want to make sure. There's been so many. Y'all start getting the names mixed up. Um, Laquan McDonald. Yep, Laquan McDonald, right? It mirrors so much of the Laquan McDonald case from 2014. So many similarities, again, where that excessive force, right? And so you're still seeing that same pattern where there's not a, where there's not a lot that has changed. And I think until people really start holding, like, feet to the fire with this, which is why I keep saying the idea of sitting out does not help because understand some of these positions are electable positions, right? And even when it comes to the judges that are going to make the decisions in these cases, some of these people are appointed or, or voted upon and everything else like that. So that idea of always, you know, kind of being removed from all of this just because you're over it, it just, it does it just does not, it doesn't help. I'm sorry. Um, I want to make sure I haven't skipped any. Oh, good. I got everything in my titles. Wonderful. God. So it's just, we'll see how that unfolds. But again, even the fact that the police are not even, you know, they haven't even been let go or suspended. It's just all their paid leave. I'm like, oh, so they get a vacation. All right. So we'll see. It, and it makes me think back to do yourself a favor or do me a favor. Go back to my Breonna Taylor video and please look at all the comments that were there initially, right? When we did Breonna Taylor and I kind of, we cracked down the case and everything. And the wave of people that swarmed in to tell me I was crazy and that she was a thug and that he had brought it on himself and they did everything wrong. And then we saw what ended up happening in the end and how there was the cover up and how there was all these different things. And it, it just goes to show that, again, like we said earlier when I was talking about OJ, the way America quickly gets on cold when certain things take place. Right. You, you're already still seeing the same narrative. Right. Somebody gets killed. People are trying to justify, and all of a sudden, he's the criminal, and so on and so forth. I'm like, but y'all are the same people who, you know, they're like, well, that gun was found in the car. I'm like, but aren't y'all the same people who are gung-ho about the Second Amendment at the same time? Like, I need us to, we need some consistency around here, because the goalposts just just, just be moving, right? Like, goal post, the goalposts, we can never get to the goalposts. Goalposts be go, going, going way over there. We can't ever get nothing. Like, Lord, my God. All right, let's go to the comments here. All right. Um, yes, it was Portia. That's who Thelma from Good Times looks like. Yep, Bernadine, Bernadette looks just like, uh, or Portia looks just like Bernadette to me from Good Times. Um, let's see where we're at here. Maggie said, yep, HBCUs are next because they are going to say they don't have enough money and they are not admitting enough white students, which is very funny to me because, again, if, if I take up Harvard, right, HBCUs at this point are taking in twice as many white students as Harvard is taking in black students. <laughs> and mind you, white students that go to HBCUs normally get the red carpet rollout, full ride scholarship, everything. But, you know, people will paint the narrative and paint, like, people, people who don't go to HBCUs from the outside looking in they are convinced that HBCU is 100% black, black panther this, F white people, and we're going to do all this super, super black stuff, and we're going to take over the country. They swear that that's what an HBCU is, when in reality, when you go to one, right, super, super diverse, you got representation from all over the world, right? Because a lot of times, again, a lot of these majority institutions are so racist with how they do things that a lot of students can't even get into the schools, and so HBCUs tend to be a bit more accommodating, so we have these massive populations of students from all over the world, not just from the continent of Africa and the Caribbean, but I'm talking about from Asia, from South and Central America, Australia, all over the world, Europe, every place. And then 
the higher up you go in academia within an HBCU, the less black it becomes. If you go to Howard's medical school, you wouldn't even realize you were at Howard when you look at how many students are not black, right? You go to a lot of these schools that have law schools or graduate programs, like a lot of representation is there. So when people try to say, oh, it's not enough this or it's discriminating against other groups, folks just haven't been there, right? And at this point, we have some HBCUs that are now majority Latino. What's the one? Is that, I forgot which one that was, it's somewhere in, I think, in Maryland. Um, well, yeah, the demographics have shifted. So I don't know where people are getting that from. You might say Minnie Ripperton. Um, well, she has a whistle register. That really doesn't fall in the same category as false settle, but she also sings in with that too. Me and Jonathan Cooper about the box because he's <laughs> talking about, wait, Janet can sing? Yes, she, we are not. Where's Belize Gal? You and Belize Gal together. Yeah. Janet does what she does. All right. Um, let's see. Thoughts on Usher's album? I think I reviewed it before. It's okay. Uh, my favorite songs are Kissing Strangers and Ruin. Um, there's a few songs. I probably would have taken off like maybe four or five songs just to Keep it a little bit shorter. I wish it had a few more up tempos, but it's, it's not bad. You know, it has some songs I, I like. Like I said, I still like Ruin. Somebody said Jippin is an offensive term. What's Jippin? What, did I say Jippin? Somebody explain that one. I don't know what Jippin is. I know like Jippin, like you screw somebody off with the money. Is that a bad thing now? All right, I ain't know. Okay. Um, oh, it is. Okay. Is a derogatory slur that refers to the wrong. Oh, all right. I'm learning something new today. All right. Okay. All right, um, let's see. Tank and the Bangers are performing at Meriwether Post Pavilion on Sunday with the Howard County Youth Orchestra. Tickets are 25 35 I do like them. I like the No ID song. That was fun. That was a fun song. That's on my gym playlist. Um, where we at here? <laughs> Rome, what up, Rome? Said Mariah's falsetto reminds me, got to be real. I wish Patty LaHell, that's the, the, the creator's name, not Patty LaBelle, but Patty LaHell. I wish she still did content. That got to be real was funny. I used to crack up at that. Like, that was a good laugh. Really good laugh. Mm -hmm. Billy Flood said, not one shot fired at Dylan Roof. Got him to Burger King, but yep. Yeah. 96 shots for a seatbelt violation. Like, how do we go from seatbelt violation to death? How do we get there? Right? Um, yeah. That, mm. Yes, all the symbolism. Yeah, we definitely talked about symbolism. Um, where are we at here? Exactly. Undercover in Chicago, pulling over a car they can't see in because, again, the windows were tinted, but somehow they couldn't see the seatbelt. You have to have a direct view through the front or an all-white interior to get a decent view. And, yeah, somehow that we this is death. Crazy. Jay Hart said, yes, one of the officers shot him 16 times within seconds of arriving on the scene. That sounds like Tamir Rice, a second and a half to comply because they thought he was an adult. I said, well, even if he was an adult, you were still going to shoot him? All he did was have a, a BB gun. It's not illegal to carry a weapon. But wow, death sentence right away. Jesus. Oh, what's your opinion of the Cowboy Carter album favorite songs? I haven't really sat with it like that. It's cool, though. Um, let me look at the track listing again. Um, let's see here. I just haven't really like sat and saturated with it, but it, I like the vocals on it. Um, my favorite songs, if I had to say, I like Desert Eagle because I like that bass riff on it. Um, Spaghetti is when the album finally gets some crankage on there. I love the the vocals on American Requiem, like the first song. Um, Bodyguard is a nice song. Um. I mean, those are the main ones. Oh, I like um, 
what's that river dance bounce on yeah, i like that one that was fun yeah i gotta kind of really sit and play it i haven't really like sat with it for too long yet but it's, it's cool um let me oh i actually just answered that thank you uh be stuff um now i'm praying beyonce please don't go on tour because i don't have the money for it i just i need everybody no more tours for 2024 all the tours are done we're gonna wait till 2025 okay <laughs> we don't have it it's too many people already on tour so we gonna you gonna have to wait Right. But I'm enjoying that Beyonce is like number one for like the last two weeks, because I'm like, that's what all the racist folks get that we're trying to downplay. And like, she's not country and she's not welcome. And gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I'm like, y'all don't own country and never have. So I'm enjoying not only watching her climb, but then even the people who were featured on the project also get a boost in streams. I'm enjoying all of it. Now, I will tell you my dream collaboration that I would love to get with. Um, let me see here. Um. What's it called? It's the group Tanya Blonde is in. Um, what is that group she's in? They were just nominated for a bunch of Grammys. Um, Tanya Blonde. Um, what is that group you're in? Hold on, I'm gonna figure this out. Warren Tree, the Warren Tree. My dream collaboration as a producer. I would love, love, love to produce a song for them. Oh, I, I like. I got a whole idea. Just sit there. They, I, they, they have the perfect voices for it. The two of them. I would love that kind of collaboration. They're not on the Beyonce project, but I just started thinking about country acts that are, um, you know, black country acts. But that would be, oh, I got ideas for them. I'm really going to still make the song and just submit it for at, or placements and see if somebody takes it. But that's a group there. Love them. All right. Let's see. Exactly. Goalposts moving with a quickness. That goal, you, goalposts don't ever stay nowhere. It, <laughs> be bouncing all over. You got to run after that thing. Then they create a law and tell you you're not allowed to run. You got to walk. And the goalposts is, you, you only can walk, 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 walk. <laughs> Man. Um, Calvin, if you could cast a Janet Jackson movie, who would you get to star as Janet? I don't know. I know everybody likes to say ha Halle Bailey because they kind of favor her to some extent. I really don't know. I don't think Janet would ever even do a movie anyway. Janet seems private. She, I don't see her wanting to do that. I know they're working on the Michael biopic, but I don't see a Janet movie anytime soon. Um, I don't see her wanting to do it, but who knows? I can't think of anybody that would play her. You know, I don't know. Some people might say Victoria Monet. Um, I don't know if she acts though, but she kind of has a lot of Janet-esque characteristics about her. Um, hmm. most likely they'd have to get somebody that's unknown, nobody's seen before, heard of, right? All right. How about William December Williams, Billy D. Williams? Oh, same blackface acting should be allowed. What's up with Hollywood being so out of time? Billy is... I'm gonna leave it there. No, Bill, <laughs> I don't even know where that came from. Cause I was looking like, I, <laughs> this is what I was thinking. Remember an undercover brother when they had General's fried chicken? Remember, cause he was in the movie and they had used the chicken to get the black folks to kind of like, we have cuckoo and align with white nationalism and anti-blackness. And then mind you, it happened to be Billy D. Williams in the movie. And you know, he had been compromised and ate the chicken. I was like, is that a real thing? Because did he actually eat some of that? Because I was like, what are you talking about? Blackface is okay. And they should, I don't understand why some people break their necks to always play devil's advocate in situations that don't need help. Like, you, we got enough going on. There's no time for folks to be getting in the way. And the problem that exists with that too, especially the people who are seasoned and people that we hold near and dear that we see as legends and everything, we're trying to be respectful, but y'all be making it difficult. Like, what are y'all doing? I'm just going to claim that he didn't understand the question and it was just old age he heard the question wrong but that wouldn't be fair to old people because i don't know he's on some nonsense with that i did not agree with that at all billy what are you doing all right been tripping see and i was gonna vote for him in mahogany i changed my mind <laughs> if y'all seen the movie you get what i'm talking about <laughs> change my mind diana should have stayed in italy if that's what we was gonna be getting it's all from the movie
Yeah, I don't know where Patty LaHell went, but those videos used to be hilarious. They got to be real funny. I like the one where they had Aretha, <laughs> when Aretha was singing That's So Raven. <laughs> she said, Good gaze into the future. She said, My good life will be breeze. <laughs> I was like, They are stupid. <laughs> it was the way they said, That breeze sounded just like Aretha the way they did it. I was like, Who is voicing these people? That was hilarious. I was dying. Man. Uh, but yeah, the way they used to have Patty and Aretha going at it on those skits used to be hilarious. Um, Princess Ariel said, did you see the gruesome murder of the young woman who didn't show up for work? Is that the girl, I shouldn't say girl, the woman who, I think she was cut into pieces, I think, by the white guy? I don't know if it's the same person. I literally just saw whatever story I'm thinking of a few hours before I started the live. I don't know if it's that story. I'd have to actually go back and research before I give an opinion on it, but that is wild. Um, yes, we talked about OJ in the beginning. So when this re-ups, um, OJ will be there and we'll have our timestamps. Give me, give me about, I try to put the timestamps on about 20 minutes after this goes live, normally, or once this wraps. Um, yes, hello from California. Somebody said, Janelle Monet was in the movie Hidden Figures, great movie, which also starred Taraji and Octavia Spencer. Oh, like um, Janelle is Janet? I don't know if that's what the suggestion is. Um, I do like Janelle Monet, though. She's, I've always thought she's very, very pretty. Um, really pretty woman. Um, let's see. Actually, speaking of got to be real, I think I have all the episodes on my hard drive. <laughs> I think I did. Yeah, I think I have them all downloaded. Like, y'all know I be archiving things. Like I told y'all I started this archiving journey like three years ago. And so any video that I see that I like, I save and keep just because stuff always disappears off YouTube. So I got all kind of concerts and clips and vid I be holding on to everything. Um, especially like when I have to like do some of like the music doc type stuff and all those videos I be using as reference, I keep all of that. Like, man. I'll be holding on to all that. I told y'all the one video I'm still looking for that I have yet to find, and it's nowhere to be found, but it's season um three of American Idol when they went when Ryan Seacrest used to have a TV show, right? And it was the season three folks. This was after Jay Hud had already been voted off, but they did Ain't No Mountain High Enough. And I don't know who pissed off Jennifer Hudson that day, but Jennifer took that song ran with it. I mean, even Fantasia and Latoya London had to take a step back, like, damn. All right. Like, man. And I used to have it on VHS, um, but I don't even know where that's at anymore because I used to record stuff off the TV. But that's one performance I've been looking for. I can't find to save my life. And it was so funny because you know how, like, back in the day, American Idol, you'd always have them three or four that were really, really good. And then you, and this is like the top 10. But then some of the other top 10 folks were just okay. So they had a portion where it was like three or four of the just okay folks that all just sang. And then they got that part to the bridge, and Jennifer came in on the be there just as fast as I can and took the song and ran with it. I was like, oh, Jennifer, go on. That's what, yeah, eighth place. Y'all tried it. Man. Uh, night, moon, uh, night. Mooling said, what do you think of J-Lo getting the business over TikTok the last few weeks? Well, I, I talked about her in the beginning of the um, video. Um, yeah, I mean, I got my opinions on J-Lo, but like I said, I think some of it is a little forced, and I think people are late to the party. With uh, like, Y'all whacking her from stuff with stuff from 20 years ago. We've been telling y'all the woman didn't sing like that. But, you know, I, at this point, it's a lot of it is performative at this point. I'm like, y'all just whacking the lady now. She ain't, it's not like this, she's not winning at anything right now. What else do you want from the woman? So it's, it's a little off to me. Because I, I have other people in mind that I think should be getting that. But I will not be messy tonight. But I think there's one person that is super, 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 super overrated and get. I'm like, how? But whatever. And it was interesting because I remember seeing some interview when Jayla was talking about, well, she's like, she's well aware that people don't check for her music like, like that. She's like, you know, it's not like anybody's rushing to, you know, anticipate the next Jayla album. I was like, okay, so she knows. So after that, I was like, I'll leave her alone. Um, but anyway. Let us see. I'm going to wind down soon. It's time to go to bed. Um.
Funny child said on air with Ryan Seacrest. It was on YouTube and they took it off. Yeah, I'll and it used to, and it was on there for years too. And then it just the one time I finally started thinking about it, it ain't on there no more. I, I hate when that happens, right? Like somebody had the like 03, 04, and 05 BET Awards on YouTube, and I, I did not get to them in time. I think they're gone now. I'm like, dang. I mean, I used to have all those on VHS too, but I don't even know where those are at. Half the stuff is at my mama's house, which means I'm probably never seeing it again. Um Oh, Nappy Child said, Jennifer even sing over Cher. What a war show was that? Was that the I Heart? I didn't like the arrangements on anybody's performance at that. Everybody sounded crazy on that. That was I Heart Awards of maybe two or three weeks ago. What I don't like musically right now with the award shows is that, one, all the music plays in multiple, it plays through multiple feeds. Like, okay, so before everything switched to digital from analog, you know, when you go back then, I forgot when everything switched over. It was sometime in the 2000s. But everything kind of played at you at, at once back in the day. So when you watched an award show, you pretty much heard exactly what the people heard in the venue. Then we kind of shifted when everything went digital. And now you have like different outlets. So there's there's a there's a feed for the house. There's a feed for the, the vocalist's mic. And usually in that feed, also most of the time, will probably include the bass guitarist and the drummer and maybe a light keyboardist. There's another feed for the additional music. There's another feed. Like, there's all these different feeds, and then all the feeds play together and come through your TV. But because the feeds all now are their own entity, the feeds also have their own EQ settings. And a lot of times with award shows, for some reason, maybe not the Grammys, because the Grammys normally sounds really good, but the vocals sound very weird. And especially if people aren't singing live, you can hear the, the vocal mix kind of sitting on top of the music and not saturated within the music. So at least back then when people weren't singing live and they had like a pre-recorded track playing within their music, and I'm talking during the analog era, it still had a, a, a complete sound. So even though you probably knew they weren't singing live, it still flowed and sounded right. Today, you hear everything sitting on top of the mix, on top of the music, right? And it just doesn't sound right. So that Cher and J-Hud performance was very weird because, you know, Cher is not singing live, but Jennifer is. And it's like, this does not flow well. Um, yeah, I didn't like none of the performances at that show. I was like, y'all can keep all of those. Um, man. Look at y'all speculating about who I'm talking about. <laughs> Calvin, in the chat, have you guys seen the show Genius MLK and X? It's pretty good. I haven't seen it yet, but I do like all of the Genius series because they do a really good job at Nat Geo. So I'm definitely planning to check that out. Did I talk about Diddy? I think I talked about Diddy. I think so. Can't remember. Yeah, yeah, I think we talked about him on the last live. Mm, yeah, he got a lot going on. A lot going on around here. Mm-mm. -mm. So right now they're playing Trippin' by Total and Missy. I stay up all night to record the song on paper or on the paper order from the radio back in elementary. What a time, what a time. Jonathan said, I like J-Lo's tribute to Tina Marie. She did a good job with Square Biz. That was that Motown tribute? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, where are we at here? Um... Yeah. I think I did a review of that one. I think so. Um, I, I, With that one, it was weird because I just, I thought she was a very interesting choice for the Motown tribute. Interesting, you know? Um, Yeah, that was interesting. Um, Yeah, it, 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 I get it. Like I said, I don't dislike J-Lo. I like J-Lo. She, she all right with me. It's, um, she's not my favorite or my go-to, but like I said, to be fair, I still think 
she is better than probably 50% of the current pop entertainers that are out and current. I'm not talking about the, the people that have been performing for you. I'm talking about the ones that we see on these Teen Choice Awards and everything that are all like 22 and 23. To me, J-Lo is doing a whole lot more than some of them. So it's kind of like when you measure J-Lo up, up against her peers, yeah, there's a different conversation. But who these folks that are out now and that rapper that uses her library voice on stage all day, like I would rather sit through J-Lo any day because at least J-Lo is going to give me some dancing and some pyrotechnics. And J-Lo is convinced that she sings down, so she's going to at least try to do some big notes. <laughs> yeah, you know, so she is still a performer. People can give her her smoke for not singing her hooks and, you know, the conversation with Tommy Mottola and where Mariah Carey falls into it. But um, I will take a get right performance over, um, I don't know who this girl is that I just saw the other day. I'm not, I'm not gonna be terrible today, but yeah, man. Let's see. I'll go back and look at that performance. I don't remember. I remember her doing, I remember her doing Square Biz, but I remember it was a bunch of people. Or a bunch of songs. I gotta go back and look. I don't remember Jonathan. I'm gonna check that one back out. Um, yeah, I just like I told y'all, my new thing has been watching Showtime at the Apollo reruns, and I love all of the early reruns from before like '92, '93, because that crowd was vicious. And I think for record labels or the few that are left, that should be the 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 selling point as to whether an artist gets signed or not. If you can survive the Apollo, like the, the people aren't getting booed enough these days, right? And so we we starting to settle for any and everything. I'm not trying to sound like the old hate millennial that don't like nothing, but dang, there's some great entertainers out there, but I'm not entertained by a lot of what's out right now, which kind of yeah, you know. Mm. But no, I do think a lot of the J-Lo whacking is performative. I'm like, y'all, I think it, it, social media does this thing where they pick and choose who they want to latch onto. I just watched some some big YouTuber who has a way bigger channel than me just did like some whole video with everything. And then I'm just watching this person say all the stuff wrong. They were saying, you remember J-Lo had the remix that Ain't That Funny? They're like, yeah, and she has some song called, or uh, some song, It Ain't Funny. I'm like, how are y'all really, like... It's different when you're live and you get something wrong because you're kind of going from the top of the dome. But like when you've actually researched and put stuff together, how are you missing those kind of simple facts? Stuff like that I'd be looking at people crazy at sideways. Like y'all are just being messy, right? Um, yeah. Kamora and Russell's daughter, what, dating that old man? I don't know what that's about. It's, in the, the entertainment world, that, that side is... They got a lot going on. At 21, and what was he, 65 or something? Say, so, okay. I don't know. I guess you, no judgment on mine. That, that ain't the life I got to live, so enjoy. Um, the thing about the Apollo is that dance acts have an advantage with seven folks in the crew. Each bring their friends and have an advantage. Well, I don't know, because some of them groups used to get booed on uh, Showtime at the Apollo. Even the dance groups were getting booed. Like, man, I was watching one. And it, what sucks is... You could, and I'm talking about the old crowd, like circa 93 and back, right? You could come out there and tear it down the minute you hit a flat note. <laughs> they start turning on you quick. And once you got about two or three booing, every, it, 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 like, it like spreads. I'm like, dang, man. And that has to be flustered to be trying to sing over a bunch of boos because you're trying to win them back. And then what ends up happening is the people try to do something that they think can overpower the crowd by trying to hit some big note that they've never hit before. And then they don't hit it. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Then that siren come on. Here come the Sandman. Like, Lord. Woo, I love those reruns. Man, love it. Love it, love it, love it. J-Lo said you're not her favorite either. And she says she want to fight. I don't have beef. Listen, I like, my, I like J-Lo the actress. Like, I love some enough. That's my movie. I thought she was good in um, what's the movie she did when she was a stripper? That that movie, I enjoyed that. I like I like acting J Lo. That's my J Lo. And it, um, like I said, um, she's cool. She cool. She's not my go to, but I like J Lo sometimes. You know, she got her. Like I was saying, like I remember being a kid and in the morning getting ready for school. One of my favorite music videos was "Feeling So Good." That was the video with her and Big Pun. And Fat Joe back in the day, I used to love that video because I was like 12. But that, that was just a fun song. I used to love that song. Um, so, yeah, all the ones who were doing the overperformative, whacking J-Lo, kicking her while she's down, 
not cool, but whatever. Um, let's see. Now we have moved on from J Lo. Don't ask me no more J Lo questions. <laughs> Don't ask me nothing else about her. <laughs> Lord. Um. Somebody said, Amory should have been just as big. The thing with Amory, I think where they dropped the ball is they took way too long in between singles. In between one thing and touch. I, let me Google how much time it was. It was a really long time between the singles. So the momentum had already died by the time she released the song Touch. Um, and that is a problem. We always talk about that on the So What Happened episodes. Um, where, whatchamacallit, yeah, too much time in between certain singles will definitely kill the momentum of an album. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Touch the single... All right, so one thing was released in Jan. Well, no, yeah, released in January of 05, and then Touch. And really, it wasn't January of 05 because it really didn't really hit until almost th that summer, right? And then Touch. Actually, no, I'm, I take that back. No, that's right. It was January of 05, but it, it hit that spring, right? And then Touch came out. May 31st of 05, but I think the video came out much later. It was just too much time in between. Um, yeah. Mm -mm. Too much time in between the singles. Like, they, by, by the time Touch had come out, um, one thing wasn't even on the radio anymore. And then there were no other, like, singles. I don't think there were any more singles from that album, right? Um, oh, Talking About, but that wasn't pushed. I just remember she performed Talking About on the Tyrus show. That was all you got. Talking About didn't chart. And then Because I Love It wasn't released in the U.S., which was actually a pretty cool album. There was a nice song on there called, um, um, is it The Way You Are? Hell, let me look on my phone again. Um, That's What You Are. That's what it was called. I used to love that song. Great single. Let's see. Um, I thought Amory was annoying. Oh, Lord, not, not annoying. Oh. Um, I'd rather be angry about Deborah Cox. Now, Deborah Cox, I will vouch for it. She should have been much bigger because Deborah sings. One of my karaoke songs is We Can't Be Friends. Every time I go back home, home to like Washington, I ain't been in six years. But me and this girl, Sophia, every time I go home, we're going to sing us some We Can't Be Friends. That is my song. Deborah sings, man. Um, I... Even the single she came out with in 2015, I really liked too. The um, what's the word said? I miss you. It's like something I miss you more than more than you ever know. What's that? So that was a really nice ballad, and I liked it because people weren't really weren't coming out with ballads anymore. But I thought that was a nice one. Uh, Deborah Cox. What was that song called? More than I knew. Great ballad. Go back and listen to that. That was a really nice song. I really enjoyed that. Um, somebody said Madonna's tour was sick. You should have gone. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and I'm convinced that that was probably her last arena tour, too. I'm like, dang, I'm probably never going to see her live now, but oh, well, you yeah, all right. I feel like the time, if I should have gone to a Madonna tour, I should have gone to the MDNA tour, or I should have gone to the Sticky and Sweet tour. Those probably should have been two I should have gone to if I, if I was going to go. Because I, I think now at this point, age has kicked in, so she's not really moving the same way. Even, you know, a lot of my favorite entertainers that have gotten up there have slowed down physically just because Father Tom calls in, the knees and the joints and stuff start aching. You can't do all that stuff you used to do in head handstands and all, right? Start slowing it down. Oh, we're supposed to be going to sleep and y'all still asking all these questions. Let's see. Um, somebody said, Diddy did Shantae more dirty with If I Gave Love. Yeah, I think I talked about that on, I think I talked about that on my Usher run. Yeah, that was kind of jacked up. Um, but I still, I'm honestly though, I, I think J-Lo's If You Have My Love is better than Shantae Moore's If I Gave You Love, even though I like Shantae Moore's If I Gave You Love. Um, and I say, I think what it is, sometimes with production, you have this really great idea. But I say the biggest gift to production is time, right? And so If I Gave Love is a really great song. It sounds just like If You Had My Love and everything. But 
you know, fast forward a year, a year to kind of sit with an idea and to enhance it. And then it just, I think sometimes you end up with something way better. So think of all of the people who had to go back to the drawing board because the label was like, no, nah, the album's not there yet, or go rework the song. And they reworked the song and it comes out like way better. That's how I see it. But um, yeah, but I, I will say, I think I like Shantae Moore's follow-up album, Exposed, more than I liked on the 60 album from J-Lo. I love that Exposed album. That was a great album. And on the 6 was cool. It had some great singles. But um, yeah, interesting how all that works. The industry is very cutthroat, unfortunately. They just do whatever they want to do. Yeah, Deborah Cox be singing. Did I talk about Coachella? Any thoughts? I don't even know who's there. Who's at Coachella this year? That Coachella is one I've never really paid attention to. Um, let's see. Oh, I think No Doubt was there. Now that would have been fun. I'll, I'll sit through a No Doubt show. That was my that was my group. Like No Doubt. Back in the day, I used to love "Hella Good" was my song because that was like a rock song you could dance to. But "New" and "Sunday Morning" and "Ex Girlfriend." I even like some of their newer stuff. I loved Push. Um, going back in time again. Um. Did I say excuse me, mister? I used to love that one. Um, oh, Bathwater. Um, it's My Life. I even like Trapped in a Box. Like, that was my group. I used to like them. Spider Webs. That was my group. Love me some No Doubt back in the day. Somebody said Tamia Kelly Price and. Deborah Cox should have went on with the group. I know they had recorded stuff. I wish we could at least get those. I don't know what happened with that. But, yeah, like I told y'all, if y'all haven't seen that Tamia and Joe show, please go. That is some singing, singing. I was, oh, that was an experience. I, Tamia was actually just here again. Her and Joe were here again on the 12th in Baltimore. Um, I, I would have almost gone. But, again, I'm trying to be responsible. There's a bunch of things I need to actually purchase that I need. So I have to stop spending money on every concert that comes to town. Oh, man. Let me see. Corey T said, no, no, no. Anne Marie, or Anne Marie said she felt that a lot of girls took her sound and ran with it after she came out with it. Why do folks fall in love? And the only person who had the go go driven RB sound was Beyonce. Um, yeah, why don't we fall in love? It's 2002. Oh, you're talking about like the brass, the bright sound, right? People kind of try to say the thing. Mm. I mean, they all work with the same producer, so you can, it's more so you, it's the sound of what the producer has, which was Rich Harrison. So yeah, Rich does Crazy in Love, but also does... Actually, I like all the songs that had that sound. So the whole Crazy in Love sound, A. Marie, one thing. My favorite of all of them was Tony Braxton's Take This Ring. That was my favorite Rich Harrison production with the big brass sound. That was my song. i pissed there's no video for that. Excellent song. It's a good one. Now, Tony, I... Now, I'll go see Tony if she open with that one, but she got to do the whole song. I need all of it. Not, don't put it in a medley. I need, I need the full song, right? Yeah, I'll go see that. Um, somebody said, to me, it never comes up to Seattle. Look, that's, I hate to say it. I'll be happy I don't live up there no more because nobody was ever coming up there. <laughs> that's why when somebody came up there, it was an event when I was little. Lord, if somebody was going to Key Arena or Tacoma Dome, where I think it's now Climate Pledge Arena now, but back in the day, if somebody was coming to Seattle, that was like an R&B act. It was like an event because nobody was ever coming. I remember Destiny's Child came, the uh, Fulfilled and Loving It tour. I wanted to go to that one too, but I think we had a homecoming game or something. And I was I was in student government. I was president at the time. No, was that? That was 05. Yeah, that was my senior year. Uh, and so I couldn't because I had to be there to at, at at the game. And I remember they, they had somebody parachute in the football for the homecoming game. And I used to get all the fun MC jobs and stuff since I was the person that liked to talk. So, yeah, I didn't get to go to that show. But, yeah, when Destiny Shaw came, it was a big ordeal. Um, all right, we are getting off in three minutes because I need to call it a night. Um, yes, people appreciate Take This Ring. Take This Ring is that, I love that song. 
Love that one. I I would have done, if I was Tony, I would have done a video for Take This Ring instead of Please. Right? I mean, it still wasn't going to make a difference because the label didn't have any money. But, man, Take This Ring, that was fun. Such a great time. All right. Let's see. What else we got on here before we call it a night? I appreciate y'all for rocking with me this late. All right? It's always, I actually enjoy doing the lives. Even though I, I prefer to make pre-made content, I like the lives because I can interact in real time, right? We catch everything in the moment. Love it. Uh, Jay, Proud, Par Jay with Proud Parent Production says, Take This Ring was a joint. Um, that wasn't on the album. Was oh, it was on the album. I have an early release version of her album. And when the actual release came out, a few songs were missing or changed. Um, yeah, it was on it was on Libra. But I remember Libra was supposed to be called... Um, God, it was supposed to be called something else. It wasn't supposed to be called Libra. I think it was called Rebel. It was supposed to be called Rebel, um, I think. I'd have, it's on my So What Happened episode. Uh, but no, Libra, great album. Uh, but th there's a lot of unreleased tracks from that era that didn't make the album. Because I remember like Long Way Home, the song, Let's Take the Long Way Home, and Happily and Happy, and Brown Baby. And yeah, Tony has a lot of B-sides too. Uh, you know, Brandy and them got a lot of B-sides, but Tony has a lot too, because she has some good ones. She has a song called Clockwork that's really, really good. I already told y'all she has a song, Be the Man I Like. Um, Not a Chance is a good one. Uh, Get Loose. Yeah, Tony has a lot of B-sides or unreleased tracks. So yeah, she has some good ones. Melt, that was a good one. Um, Yeah, Tony, that, that, I might have to revisit Tony tomorrow at work. She might be on the playlist tomorrow. Tony be having some gems. Am I watching X Men ninety seven? I probably am. Might be watching that. I need to see um Civil War too. Somebody said watch that one when I get a chance. I said, All right. What are your thoughts of the rumors of the OG members of Destiny's Child being on a sixteen carriages demo remix? I support it. I would like. I don't know what Essence is doing, but I think if Essence was smart. Because, like I said, they got a lot of competition this summer because everybody's on tour and you got lovers and friends. If they were able to pull off a Destiny's Child reunion on one of the main stage nights, that will get everybody up in there. And, like, you have the original plus Michelle, like, you have them five. Like, that will be a man, that thing will sell out so fast. That'd be a fun show. Right? And then you could have them all. You, Beyonce can still have a segment where she do some of her solo stuff. Kelly can do some of hers. Latoya can do some of hers. Michelle can do a little bit of her gospel. And, and, and actually, Michelle had a nice album, too, the Unexpected album. Where, and, and it's interesting because people be making fun of her. But, like, honestly, right before that whole electro pop wave that started in 08 and then transitioned into EDM around 2010, 11, 12, Michelle was the first one. She was the first one working with Rico Love way before everybody else. I will say that. So Michelle knew what the trend was. Y'all just laughed at her. But that was a fun album. That album had this nice this song on there called Till the end of the world that I liked. And Lucky, was it Luckiest Girl? Yeah, Michelle. I might have a whole... I need to schedule another Zoom party. We ain't had one of those in a few years. I just have a Zoom party, I'm going to just start playing music. We're just going to have a jam session. I can't do it on here because YouTube be flagging you for playing people music, but we could do it on Zoom. Hey, Calvin, um, when will the book club meet again? Oh, yeah, we're meeting on the 22nd. Is that 22nd next Monday? Let me make sure I got the date right. 22nd next Monday... Chapters 12 through 18 of The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. All right, we are getting off. I'll do two more questions, then I'm going to call it a night. Um, somebody said, as Invoke said, never going to get it with the DC reunion. I mean, they've all been together. Who knows? I mean, look, Invoke got together with all of the original four plus Rona. We had the five at that one event, so who knows? I was really hoping that they would make something of that and keep going, but they let it ride on out. It's like, okay, but, you know, oh, well. Somebody said, I didn't know you did playlist parties. Well, I do got playlists on Spotify that I still update in real time. There's, like, four main ones that I push that are in my description. So there's, like, the R&B Gems, which is kind of just a mix of everything from between the 70s and the present. Um, and then there's a... R&B wind down, which is more so kind of like a slow down, chill, 
session or not even chill session because that's that's more like the slower r&b song then there's the cool down party that's kind of just the more right here in this pocket chop it down there's the new jack swing and house dance playlist um and then you know i keep updating them over time so yeah those are the main four I'm not y'all saying you requesting this time for the percolator. We need a dance session. <laughs> I do like that people are starting to dance again. That would be cool. Um, I might say, which groups do you wish would collab? Oh, that's Alan. What up, Alan? Which groups do you wish would collaborate on a song? There's not even that many groups anymore. I don't even know who I want to get. <laughs> um, but I like that SWV and Escape have a show together. So I wonder what a song of theirs would sound like, right? Those are some really cool textures going together. You have Coco, who has this really, really rich voice, rich with a great bottom in it, right? Um, Candy has the lows. Candy, Candy and Taj taking the lows would be kind of interesting together. Lily kind of still holds that middle. Lily and well, Tamika kind of takes the middle and the high, too. So does, damn, Tiny and Tamika take the middle and the high. Actually, all of them take the highs in the middle except Candy. Candy kind of stay at the lows unless she's doing a solo. And then I guess the day might invite Latasha back. Um, that could be an interesting mix of a song. Speaking of, I just did like my first musical collab with another, it was a set of us. Um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but it's kind of cool. Um, it's like me and like four other like producer singer folks. And yeah, it was a really dope track that we did. All of us were in separate studios, different states. Everybody was sent the reference track as all of us produced. And, you know, we all just did our different portions and pieces. And then my task was kind of mainly all of the, the backgrounds are being the foundation of the backgrounds and all that. And then piecing everything together. It'd be really cool to hear what it sounds like. So I'm looking forward to that. When it comes out, I'll share it with y'all. But, um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, Poison Ivy said, I thought I'd never, I thought we'd never see a Tony, Tony, Tony reunion. But you never know. That's very true. Because, um, yeah, that was a fun show. Uh, when they were here last year. Fun show. Anyway, all right, y'all. It is bedtime for me and for you on the East Coast because we got to go to work tomorrow, right? So I appreciate y'all hanging. Exactly, uh, Sassy. That's why I said I'm going to bed in three minutes, in quotes. And here I am <laughs> 10 minutes later. But yeah, anyway, this has been dope. I appreciate it. Thanks for hanging with me. And remember to mind your business so that you can age well. All right, I'm out. See you guys later this week.